Chapter Three of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter Three Up the St. Mary's. If Sergeant Rivers was a natural king among my dusky soldiers, Corporal Robert Sutton was the natural Prime Minister. If not in all respects the ablest, he was the wisest man in our ranks. As large, as powerful, and as black as our good-looking colour sergeant, but more heavily built and with less personal beauty, he had a more massive brain and a far more meditative and systematic intellect. Not yet grounded even in the spelling-book, his modes of thought were nevertheless strong, lucid, and accurate, and he yearned and pined for the intellectual companionship beyond all ignorant men whom I have ever met. I believe he would have talked all day and all night for days together to any officer who could instruct him until his companions at least fell asleep exhausted. His comprehension of the whole problem of slavery was more thoroughly and far-reaching than that of any abolitionist, so far as its social and military aspects went. In that direction I could teach him nothing, and he taught me much. But it was his methods of thought which always impressed me chiefly. Superficial brilliancy he left to others, and grasped at the solid truth. Of course his interest in the war, and in the regiment, was unbounded. He did not take to drill with a special readiness, but he was insatiable of it, and grudged every moment of relaxation. Indeed, he never had any such moments. His mind was at work at all time, even when he was singing hymns, of which he had an endless store. He was not, however, one of our leading religionists, but his moral code was solid and reliable, like his mental processes. Ignorant as he was, the years that bring that philosophic mind had yet been his, and most of my young officers seemed boys beside him. He was a Florida man, and had been chiefly employed in lumbering and piloting on the St. Mary's River, which divides Florida from Georgia. Down this stream he had escaped in a dugout, and after thus finding his way, had returned, as had not a few of my men in other cases, to bring away wife and child. I wouldn't have left my child, Colonel, he said, with an emphasis that sounded the depths of his strong nature. And up this same river he was always imploring to be allowed to guide an expedition. Many other men had rival propositions to urge, for they gained self-confidence from drill and guard duty, and were growing impatient of inaction. Ought to go to work, sir. Don't believe him we lying in camp eating up de provisions. Such was the quaint complaints which I heard with joy. Looking over my notebooks of that period, I find them filled with topographical memoranda, jotted down by a flickering candle, from the evening talk of the men. Notes of vulnerable points along the coast, charts of rivers, locations of pickets. I prized these conversations not more for what I thus learned of the country than for what I learned of the men. One could thus measure their various degrees of accuracy and their average military instinct, and I must say that in every respect, save the accurate estimate of distances, they stood the test well. But no project took my fancy so much, after all, as that of the delegate from the St. Mary's River. The best peg on which to hang an expedition in the Department of the South in those days was the promise of lumber. Dwelling in the very land of southern pine, the department authorities had to send north for it, at a vast expense. There was reported to be plenty in the enemy's country, but somehow the coloured soldiers were the only ones who had been lucky enough to obtain any thus far, and the supply brought in by our men, after flooring the tents of the white regiments and our own, was running low. An expedition of white troops, four companies with two steamers and two schooners, had lately returned empty-handed, after a week's foraging, and now it was our turn. They said the mills were all burned, but should we go up the St. Mary's, Corporal Sutton was prepared to offer more lumber than we had transportation to carry. This made the crowning charm of his suggestion, but there is never any danger of erring on the side of secrecy in a military department, and I resolved to avoid all undue publicity for our plans, by not finally deciding on any until we could get outside of the bar. This was happily approved by my superior officers, Major General Hunter and Brigadier General Saxton, and I was accordingly permitted to take three steamers with 462 officers and men and two or three invited guests 
and go down the coast on my own responsibility. We were, in short, to win our spurs, and if, as many among the Araucanians, our spurs were made of lumber, so much the better. The whole history of the Department of the South had been defined as a military picnic, and now we were to take our share of the entertainment. It seemed a pleasant share, when, after the usual vexations and delays, we found ourselves, January 23, 1863, gliding down the full waters of Beaufort River, with three vessels having sailed at different hours, with orders to rendezvous at St. Simon's Island on the coast of Georgia. Until then, the flagship, so to speak, was to be the Ben de Ford, Captain Hallett, this being by far the largest vessel, and carrying most of the men. Major Strong was in command upon the John Adams, an army gunboat, carrying a 30-pound parrot gun, two 10-pound parrots, and an 8-inch howitzer. Captain Trowbridge, since promoted Lieutenant Colonel of the regiment, had charge of the famous planter, brought away from the rebels by Robert Small. She carried a 10-pound parrot gun and two howitzers. The John Adams was our main reliance. She was an old East Boston ferry boat, a double-ender, admirable for river work, but unfit for sea service. She drew seven feet of water. The planter drew only four, but the latter was very slow, and being obliged to go to St. Simon's by an inner passage would delay us from the beginning. She delayed us so much before the end that we virtually parted company, and her career was almost entirely separated from our own. From boyhood I have had a fancy for boats, and have seldom been without a share, usually more or less fractional, in a rather indeterminate number of punts and wherries. But when for the first time I found myself at sea as commodore of a fleet of armed steamers, for even Ben de Ford boasted a six-pounder or so, it seemed rather an unexpected promotion. But it is characteristic of army life that one adapts oneself as coolly as in a dream to the most novel of responsibilities. One sits on a court-martial, for instance, and decides on the life of a fellow creature, without being asked any inconvenient questions as to previous knowledge of Blackstone. And after such an experience, shall one shrink from wrecking a steamer or two in the cause of the nation? So I placidly accepted my naval establishment, as if it were a new form of boat club, and looked over the charts, balancing between one river and another, as if deciding whether to pull up or down Lake Quigisimond. If military life ever contemplated the exercise of the virtue of humility under any circumstances, this would perhaps have been a good opportunity to begin its practice. But as the regulations clearly contemplated nothing of the kind, and I had never met with any precedent which looked in that direction, I had learned to check promptly all such weak proclivities. Captain Hallett proved the most frank and manly of sailors, and did everything for our comfort. He was soon warm in his praises of the demeanour of our men, which was very pleasant to hear, as this was the first time that coloured soldiers in any number had been conveyed on board a transport, and I know of no place where a white volunteer appears to be so much disadvantage. His mind craves occupation, his body is intensely uncomfortable, the daily emergency is not great enough to call out his heroic qualities, and he is apt to be surly, discontented, and impatient even of the sanitary rules. The southern black soldier, on the other hand, is seldom seasick, at least such is my experience, and if properly managed, is equally contented whether idle or busy. He is, moreover, so docile that all needful rules are executed with cheerful acquiescence, and the quarters can therefore be kept clean and wholesome. Very forlorn faces were soon visible among the officers in the cabin, but I rarely saw such among the men. Pleasant still seemed our enterprise, as we anchored at early morning in the quiet waters of St. Simon's Sound, and saw the light fall softly on the beach and the low bluffs, on the picturesque plantation houses which nestled there, and the graceful naval vessels that lay at anchor before us. When we afterwards landed, the air had that peculiar Mediterranean translucency which southern islands wear, and the plantation we visited had the loveliest tropical garden, though tangled and desolate, which I had ever seen in the south. The deserted house was embowered in great blossoming shrubs, and filled with hyacinth odours, among which predominated that of the little Chickasaw roses, which everywhere bloomed and trailed around. There were fig trees and date palms, crepe myrtles and wax myrtles, Mexican agraves and English ivies, 
japonicas, bananas, oranges, lemons, oleanders, jonquils, great cactuses, and wild Florida lilies. This was not the plantation which Mrs. Kemble has since made historic, although that was on the same island, and I could not waste much sentiment over it, for it had belonged to a northern renegade, Thomas Butler King. Yet I felt then, as I have felt a hundred times since, an emotion of heart-sickness at this desecration of a homestead, and especially when looking from a bare upper window of the empty house upon a range of broad, flat, sunny roofs, such as children love to play on, I thought how that place might have been loved by yet innocent hearts, and I mourned anew the sacrilege of war. I had visited the flagship Wabash, ere we left Port Royal Harbour, and had obtained a very kind letter of introduction from Admiral Dupont, that stately, courtly potentate, elegant as one's ideal French Marquis, and under these credentials I received polite attention from the naval officers at St. Simon's, acting volunteer Lieutenant Budd of the gunboat Podomiska, and acting Master Moses of the bark Fernandina. They made valuable suggestions in regard to the different rivers along the coast, and gave vivid descriptions of the last previous trip up the St. Mary's undertaken by Captain Stevens, USN, in the gunboat Ottawa, when he had to fight his way past batteries at every bluff in descending the narrow and rapid stream. I was warned that no resistance would be offered to the ascent, but only to our return, and was further cautioned against this mistake, then common, of underrating the courage of the rebels. It proved impossible to dislodge those fellows from the banks, my informant said. They had dug rifle pits, and swarmed like hornets, and when fairly silenced in one direction, they were sure to open upon us from another. All this sounded alarming, but it was nine months since the event had happened, and although nothing had gone up the river meanwhile, I counted on less resistance now, and something must be risked anywhere. We were delayed all that day in waiting for our consort, and improved our time by verifying certain rumours about a quantity of new railroad iron, which was said to be concealed in the abandoned rebel forts on St. Simon's and Jekyll Islands, and which would have much value at Port Royal, if we could unearth it. Some of our men had worked upon these very batteries, so that they could easily guide us, and by the additional discovery of a large flat boat, we were enabled to go to work in earnest upon the removal of the treasure. These iron bars, surmounted by a dozen feet of sand, formed an invulnerable roof for the magazines and bomb-proofs of the fort, and the men enjoyed demolishing them far more than they had relished their construction. Though the day was the 24th of January, 1863, the sun was very oppressive upon the sands, but all were in the highest spirits, and worked with the greatest zeal. The men seemed to regard these massive bars as their first trophies, and if the rails had been wreathed with roses, they could not have been got out in a more holiday style. Nearly a hundred were obtained that day, besides a quantity of five-inch plank, with which to barricade the very conspicuous pilot-houses of the John Adams. Still another day we were delayed, and could still keep at this work, not neglecting some foraging on the island, from which horses, cattle, and agricultural implements were to be removed, and the few remaining coloured families transferred to the Fernandina. I had now become quite anxious about the missing steamboat, as the inner passage, by which alone she could arrive, was exposed at certain points to fire from rebel batteries, and it would have been unpleasant to begin with a disaster. I remember that, as I stood on deck in the still and misty evening, listening with strained senses for some sound of approach, I heard a low, continuous noise from the distance, more wild and desolate than anything in my memory can parallel. It came from within the vast girdle of mist, and seemed like the cry of a myriad of lost souls upon the horizon's verge. It was Dante becoming audible, and yet it was but the accumulated cries of innumerable sea-fowl at the entrance to the outer bay. Late that night the planter arrived. We left St. Simon's on the following morning, reached Fort Clinch by four o'clock, and there transferring two hundred men to the very scanty quarters at John Adams, allowed the larger transport to go into Fernandina, while the other two vessels were to ascend the St. Mary's River, unless, as proved inevitable in the end, the defects of the boiler in the planter should oblige her to remain behind. That night I proposed to make a sort of trial trip upstream, as far as the township landing, some fifteen miles, there to pay our respects to Captain Clark's company of cavalry, whose camp was reported to lie nearby. 
This was included in Corporal Sutton's programme, and seemed to me more inviting and far more useful to the men than any amount of mere foraging. The thing really desirable appeared to be to get them under fire as soon as possible, and to teach them, by a few small successes, the application of what they had learned in camp. I had ascertained that the camp of this company lay five miles from the landing, and was accessible by two roads, one of which was a lumber path not commonly used, but which Corporal Sutton had helped to construct, and along which he could easily guide us. The plan was to go by night, surround the house and negro cabins at the landing, to prevent an alarm from being given, then to take the side path, and if all went well, to surprise the camp. But if they got notice of our approach through their pickets, we should at worst have a fight in which the best man must win. The moon was bright and the river swift, but easy of navigation thus far. Just below township I landed a small advance force to surround the houses silently. With them went Corporal Sutton, and when after rounding the point I went on shore with a larger body of men, he met me with a silent chuckle of delight, and with the information that there was a negro in the neighbouring cabin, who had just come from the rebel camp, and could give the latest information. While he hunted up the valuable auxiliary, I mustered my detachment, winnowing out the men who had coughs, not a few, and sending them ignominiously on board again, a process I had regularly to perform during this first season of Qatar, on all occasions where quiet was needed. The only exception, tolerated at the time, was in the case of one man who offered a solemn pledge that, if unable to restrain his cough, he would lie down on the ground, scrape a little hole, and cough into it unheard. The ingenuity of this proposition was irresistible, and the eager patient was allowed to pass muster. It was after midnight when we set off upon our excursion. I had about a hundred men, marching by the flank, with a small advance guard, and also a few flankers, where the ground permitted. I put my Florida company at the head of the column, and had by my side Captain Metcalf, an excellent officer, and Sergeant McIntyre, his first sergeant. We plunged presently into pine woods whose resinous smell I can still remember. Corporal Sutton marched near me with his captured negro guide, whose first fear and sullenness had yielded to the magic news of the President's proclamation, then just issued, of which Governor Andrew had sent me a large printed supply. We seldom found men who could read it, but they all seemed to feel more secure when they had held it in their hands. We marched on through the woods, with no sound but the peeping of the frogs in a neighbouring marsh, and the occasional yelping of a dog as we passed the hut of some cracker. This yelping always made Corporal Sutton uneasy. Dogs are detective officers of slavery police. We had halted once or twice to close up the ranks, and had marched some two miles, seeing and hearing nothing more. I had got all I could out of our new guide, and was striding on, wrapped in pleasing contemplation. All had gone so smoothly, that I had merely to fancy the rest as being equally smooth. Already I fancied our little detachment bursting out of the woods in swift surprise upon the rebel quarters. Already the opposing commander, after hastily firing a charge or two from his revolver, of course above my head, had yielded at discretion, and was gracefully tendering in stage attitude his unavailing sword, when suddenly there was a trampling of feet among the advance guard as they came confusedly to a halt, and almost at the same instant a more ominous sound, as of galloping horses in the path before us. The moonlight outside the woods gave that dimness of atmosphere within which is more bewildering than darkness, because the eyes cannot adapt themselves to it so well. Yet I fancied, and others aver, that they saw the leader of an approaching party mounted on a white horse and reining up in the pathway. Others again declare that he drew a pistol from the holster and took aim. Others heard the words, Charge in upon them! Surround them! But all this was confused by the opening rifle shots of our advance guard, and, as clear observation was impossible, I made the men fix their bayonets and kneel in the cover on each side of the pathway, and I saw with delight the brave fellows with Sergeant McIntyre at their head, settling down in the grass as coolly and warily as if wild turkeys were the only game. Perhaps at the first shot a man fell at my elbow. I felt it no more than if a tree had fallen. I was so busy watching my own men and the enemy, and planning what to do next, some of our soldiers misunderstanding the order fixed bayonets, were actually charging with them, dashing off into the dim woods with nothing to charge at but the vanishing tail of an imaginary horse, for we could really see nothing. This zeal I noted with pleasure, and also with anxiety, as our greatest danger was from confusion and scattering. 
and for infantry to pursue cavalry would be a novel enterprise. Captain Metcalf stood by me, well in keeping the men steady, as did Assistant Sergeant Minor and Lieutenant, now Captain, Jackson. How the men in the rear were behaving I could not tell, not so coolly I afterwards found, because they were more entirely bewildered, supposing until the shots came that the column had simply halted for a moment's rest, as had been done once or twice before. They did not know who or where their assailants might be, and the fall of the man beside me created a hasty rumour that I was killed, so that it was on the whole an alarming experience for them. They kept together very tolerably, however, while our assailants dividing rode along each side through the open pine barren firing into our ranks, but mostly over the heads of the men. My soldiers, in turn, fired rapidly, too rapidly, being yet beginners, and it was evident that in the dim as it was, both sides had opportunity to do some execution. I could hardly tell whether the fight had lasted ten minutes or an hour, when, as the enemy's fire had evidently ceased or slackened, I gave the order to cease firing. But it was very difficult at first to make them desist. The taste of gunpowder was too intoxicating. One of them was heard to mutter indignantly, Why de cunnel order cease firing when de sechesh blazing away at a rate of ten dollar a day? Every incidental occurrence seemed somehow to engrave itself upon my perceptions, without interrupting the main course of thought. Thus I know that in one of the pauses of the affair there was some wailing through the woods, a cracked female voice, as if calling some stray husband who had run out to join the affray. "'John, John, are you going to leave me, John? Are you going to let me and the children be killed, John?' I suppose the poor thing's fears of gunpowder were very genuine, but it was such a wailing squeak, and so infinitely ludicrous, and John was probably ensconced so very safely in some hollow tree, that I could see some of the men showing all their white teeth in the very midst of the fight. But soon this sound with all the others had ceased, and left us in peaceful possession of the field. I have made more of this little affair, because it was the first stand-up fight in which my men had been engaged, though they had been under fire in an irregular way in their small early expeditions. To me personally, the event was of greatest value. It had given us all an opportunity to test each other, and our abstract surmises were changed into positive knowledge. Hereafter it was of no small importance what nonsense might be talked or written about coloured troops. So long as mine did not flinch, it made no difference to me. My brave young officers themselves, mostly new to danger, viewed the matter much as I did, and yet we were under the bonds of life and death to form a correct opinion, which was more than could be said of the northern editors, and our verdict was proportionately of greater value. I was convinced from appearances that we had been victorious so far, though I could not suppose that this would be the last of it. We knew neither the numbers of the enemy, nor their plans, nor their present condition. Whether they had surprised us, or whether we had surprised them, was all a mystery. Corporal Sutton was urgent to go on, and complete the enterprise. All my impulses said the same thing. But then I had the most explicit injunctions from General Saxton to risk as little as possible in this first enterprise, because of the fatal effect on public sentiment of even an honourable defeat. We had now an honourable victory, so far as it went. The officers and men around me were in good spirits, but the rest of the column might be nervous, and it seemed so important to make the first fight an entire success, that I thought it wiser to let well alone, nor have I ever changed this opinion. For oneself, Montrose's verse may well be applied, to win or lose it all, but one has no right to deal thus lightly with the fortunes of a race, and that was the weight which I always felt as resting on our action. If my raw infantry force had stood unflinchingly a night surprise from de Boss cavalry, as they reverently termed them, I felt that a good beginning had been made. All hope of surprising the enemy's camp was now at an end. I was willing and ready to fight the cavalry over again, but it seemed wiser that we, not they, should select the ground. Attending to the wounded, therefore, and making as best we could stretchers for those who were to be carried, including the remains of the man killed at the first discharge, Private William Parsons of Company G, and others who seemed at the point of death. We marched through the woods to the landing, expecting at every moment to be involved in another fight. This not occurring, I was more than ever satisfied that we had won the victory, for it was obvious that a mounted force would not allow a detachment of infantry to march two miles through open woods at night without renewing the fight, unless they themselves had suffered a good deal.' 
On arrival at the landing, there seemed that there was to be no immediate affray. I sent most of the men on board, and called for volunteers to remain on shore with me, and hold the plantation house till morning. They eagerly offered, and I was glad to see them, when posted as sentinels by Lieutenants Hyde and Jackson, who stayed with me, paced their beats as steadily and challenge as coolly as veterans, though, of course, there was some powder wasted on imaginary foes. Greatly to my surprise, however, we had no other enemies to encounter. We did not yet know that we had killed the first lieutenant of the cavalry, and that our opponents had retreated to the woods in dismay, without daring to return to their camp. This, at least, was the account we heard from prisoners afterwards, and was evidently the tale current in the neighbourhood, though the statements published in the southern newspapers did not correspond. Admitting the death of Lieutenant Jones, the Tallahassee Floridian of February 14th stated that Captain Clark, finding the enemy in strong force, fell back with his command to camp, and removed his ordnance and commissary from the stores with twelve negroes on their way to the enemy captured that day. In the morning, my invaluable surgeon, Dr. Rogers, sent me his report of killed and wounded, and I have been since permitted to make the following extracts from his notes. One man killed instantly by ball through the heart, and seven wounded, one of whom will die. Braver men never lived. One man with two bullet holes through the large muscles of the shoulders and neck brought off from the scene of action, two miles distant, two muskets, and not a murmur has escaped his lips. Another, Robert Sutton, with three wounds, one of which was being on the skull, may cost him his life, would not report himself till compelled to do so by his officers. While dressing his wounds, he quietly talked of what they had done, and of what they yet could do. Today I have had the colonel order him to obey me. He is perfectly quiet and cool, but takes this whole affair with the religious bearing of a man who realizes that freedom is sweeter than life. Yet another soldier did not report himself at all, but remained all night on guard, and possibly I should not have known of his having a buckshot in the shoulder if some duty requiring a sound shoulder had not been required of him today. This last, it may be added, had persuaded a comrade to dig out the buckshot for fear of being ordered on the sick list. And one of those who were carried to the vessel, a man wounded through the lungs, asked only if I were safe, the contrary having been reported. An officer may be pardoned some enthusiasm for such men as these. The anxious night having passed away without an attack, another problem opened with the morning. For the first time my officers and men found themselves in possession of an enemy's abode, and though there was but little temptation to plunder, I knew that I must here begin to draw the line. I had long since resolved to prohibit absolutely all indiscriminate pilfering and wanton outrage, and to allow nothing to be taken or destroyed but by proper authority. The men, to my great satisfaction, entered into this view at once, and so did, perhaps a shade less readily in some cases, the officers. The greatest trouble was with the steamboat hands, and I resolved to let them go ashore as little as possible. Most articles of furniture were already, however, before our visit, gone from the plantation house, which was now used only as a picket station. The only valuable article was a pianoforte, for which a regular packing box lay invitingly ready outside. I had made up my mind, in accordance with the orders given to naval commanders in that department, to burn all picket stations, and all villages from which I could be covertly attacked, and nothing else, and as this house was destined to the flames, I should have left the piano in it, but for the seductions of that box. With such a receptacle already, even to the cover, it would have seemed like flying in the face of providence, not to put the piano in. I ordered it removed, therefore, and afterwards presented it to the school for coloured children at Fernandina. This I mention because it is the only article of property I ever took, or knowingly suffered to be taken, in the enemy's country, save for legitimate military uses from first to last, nor would I have taken this, but for the thought of the school, and, as aforesaid, the temptation of the box. If any other officer had been more rigid with equal opportunities, let him cast the first stone. It is my desire to avoid the destruction of private property, unless used for picket or guard stations, or for other military purposes by the enemy. Of course, if fired upon from any place, it is your duty, if possible, to destroy it. Letter of Admiral Dupont, commanding South Atlantic Squadron, to Lieutenant Commander Hughes, of United States gunboat Mohawk, Fernandina Harbour. 
I think the zest with which my men finally set fire to the house at my order was enhanced by this previous abstemiousness, but there is a fearful fascination in the use of fire, which every child knows in the abstract, and which I found to hold true in practice. On our way down the river, we had opportunity to test this again. The ruined town of St. Mary's had, at that time, a bad reputation, among both naval and military men. Lying but a short distance above Fernandina, on the Georgia side, it was occasionally visited by our gunboats. I was informed that the only residents of the town were three old women, who were, apparently, kept there as spies, that on our approach the aged crones would come out and wave white handkerchiefs, and that they would receive us hospitably, profess to be profoundly loyal, and exhibit a portrait of Washington, that they would solemnly assure us that no rebel pickets had been there for many weeks, but that in the adjoining yard we would find fresh horse tracks, and that we should be fired upon by guerrillas the moment we left the wharf. My officers had been much excited by these tales, and I had assured them that, if this program were literally carried out, we would straight away return and burn the town, or what was left of it, for our share. It was essential to show my officers and men that while rigid against irregular outrage, we could still be inexorable against the enemy. We had previously planned to stop at this town, on our way down river, for some valuable lumber which we had espied on a wharf, and gliding down the swift current, shelling a few bluff as we passed, we soon reached it. Punctual as the figures in a panorama appeared the old ladies with their white handkerchiefs. Taking possession of the town, much of which had previously been destroyed by the gunboats, and stationing the colour guard to the infinite delight in the cupola of the most conspicuous house, I deployed skirmishers along the exposed suburb, and set a detail of men to work on the lumber. After a stately and decorous interview with the Queens of Society of St. Mary's, it is Scott who says that nothing improves the manners like piracy, I peacefully withdrew the men when the work was done. There were faces of disappointment among the officers, for all felt a spirit of mischief after last night's adventure, when, just as we had fairly swung out into the stream and were under way, there came, like the sudden burst of a tropical tornado, a regular little hailstorm of bullets into the open end of the boat, driving every gunner in an instant from his post, and surprising even those who were looking to be surprised. The shock was but for a second, and though the bullets had pattered precisely like the sound of hail upon the iron cannon, yet nobody was hurt. With very respectable promptness, order was restored. Our own shells were flying into the woods from which the attack proceeded, and we were steaming up to the wharf again, according to promise. Who shall describe the theatrical attitudes assumed by the old ladies as they reappeared at the front door, being luckily out of the direct range, and set the handkerchiefs in wilder motion than ever? They brandished them, they twirled them after the manner of the domestic mop, they clasped their hands, handkerchiefs included, Meanwhile their friends in the woods popped away steadily at us with small effect, and occasionally an invisible field-piece thundered feebly from another quarter, with equally invisible results. Reaching the wharf, one company under Lieutenant, now Captain, Danielson, was promptly deployed in search of our assailants, who soon grew silent. Not so the old ladies, when I announced to them my purpose, and added with extreme regret, that as the wind was high, I should burn only that half of the town which lay to leeward of their house, which did not, after all, amount to much. Between gratitude for the degree of mercy, and imploring appeals for greater, the treacherous old ladies manoeuvred with clasped hands and demonstrative handkerchiefs around me, impairing the effect of their eloquence by constantly addressing me as Mr. Captain. For I have observed that while the sternest officer is greatly propitiated by attributing to him a rank a little higher than his own, yet no one is ever mollified by an error in the opposite direction. I tried, however, to disregard such low considerations, and to strike the correct mean between the sublime patriot and the unsanctified incendiary, while I could find no refuge from weak contrition, saving greater and greater depths of courtesy, and so melodramatic became our interview that some of the soldiers still maintain that dem da ol' sesesh women bin a gwine for kiss de cunnel, before we ended. But of this monstrous accusation I wish to register an explicit denial once and for all. Dropping down to Fernandina unmolested after this affair, we were kindly received by the military and naval commanders, Colonel Hawley of the 7th Connecticut, now Brigadier General Hawley, and Lieutenant Commander Hughes of the gunboat Mohawk. 
It turned out very opportunely that both of these officers had special errands to suggest still further up the St. Mary's, and precisely in the region where I wished to go. Colonel Hawley showed me a letter from the War Department, requesting him to ascertain the possibility of obtaining a supply of brick for Fort Clinch from the brickyard, which had furnished the original materials, but which had not been visited since the perilous river trip of the Ottawa. Lieutenant Hughes wished to obtain information for the Admiral respecting a rebel steamer, the Barroza, said to be lying somewhere up the river, and awaiting her chance to run the blockade. I jumped at the opportunity. Barroza and Brickyard, both were near Woodstock, the former home of Corporal Sutton. He was ready and eager to pilot us up the river. The moon would be just right that evening, setting at three hours and nineteen minutes a.m., and our boat was precisely the one to undertake the expedition. Its double-headed shape was just what was needed in that swift and crooked stream. The exposed pilot houses had been tolerably barricaded with thick planks from St. Simon's, and we further obtained some sandbags from Fort Clinch. Through the aid of Captain Sears, the officer in charge, who had originally suggested the expedition after Brick. In return for this aid, the planter was sent back to the wharf at St. Mary's to bring away a considerable supply of the same precious article, which we had observed near the wharf. Meanwhile, the John Adams was coaling from naval supplies, through the kindness of Lieutenant Hughes, and the Bendy Ford was taking in the lumber which we had yesterday brought down. It was a great disappointment to be unable to take the latter vessel up the river, but I was unwillingly convinced that, though the depth of the water might be sufficient, yet her length would be unmanageable in the swift current and sharp turns. The planter must also be sent on a separate cruise, as her weak, disabled machinery had made her useless for the purpose. Two hundred men were therefore transferred as before to the narrow hold of the John Adams, in addition to the company permanently stationed on board to work the guns. At seven o'clock in the evening of January the 29th, beneath a lovely moon, we steamed up the river. Never shall I forget the mystery and excitement of that night. I know nothing in life more fascinating than the nocturnal ascent of an unknown river, leading far into an enemy's country, where one glides in the dim moonlight between the dark hills and meadows, each turn of the channel making it seem like an inland lake, and cutting you off as by a barrier from all behind, with no sign of human life, but an occasional picket fire left glimmering beneath the bank, or the yelp of a dog from some low-lying plantation. On such occasions every nerve is strained to its utmost tension. All dreams of romance appear to promise immediate fulfilment. All lights on board the vessel are obscured. Loud voices are hushed. You fancy a thousand men on shore and yet see nothing. The lonely river, unaccustomed to furring keels, lapses by the vessel with a treacherous sound, and all the senses are merged in a sort of anxious trance. Three times I have had in full perfection this fascinating experience. But that night was the first, and its zest was the keenest. It will come back to me in dreams if I live a thousand years. I feared no attack during our ascent. That danger was for our return. But I feared the intricate navigation of the river, though I did not fully know, till the actual experience, how dangerous it was. We passed without trouble far above the scene of our first fight, the Battle of the Hundred Pines, as my officers have baptized it, and ever, as we ascended, the banks grew steeper, the current swifter, the channel more tortuous, and more encumbered with projecting branches and drifting wood. No piloting less skilful than that of Corporal Sutton and his mate, James Bezard, could have carried us through. I thought, and no side-wheel steamer less strong than a ferry-boat could have borne the crash and force with which we struck the wooded banks of the river. But the powerful paddles built to the break the northern ice could crush the southern pine as well, and we came safely out of the entanglements that at first seemed formidable. We had the tide with us, which makes steering far more difficult, and in the sharp angles of the river there was often no resource but to run the bow boldly on shore, let the stern swing round, and then reverse the motion. As the reversing machinery was generally out of order, the engineer, stupid or frightened, and the captain excited, this involved moments of tolerably concentrated anxiety. Eight times we grounded in the upper waters, and once lay aground for half an hour, but at last we dropped anchor before the little town of Woodstock, after moonset, and an hour before daybreak, just as I had planned, and so quietly that scarcely a dog barked, and not a soul in the town, as we afterwards found, knew of our arrival.' 
As silently as possible, the great flat boat which we had brought from St. Simon's was filled with men. Major Strong was sent on shore with two companies, those of Captain James and Captain Metcalf, with instructions to surround the town quietly, allow no one to leave it, molest no one, and hold as temporary prisoners every man whom he found. I watched them push off into the darkness, got the remaining force ready to land, and then paced the deck for an hour in silent watchfulness, waiting for rifle shots. Not a sound came from the shore, save the barking of dogs and the morning crow of cocks. The time seemed interminable, but when daylight came, I landed and found a pair of scarlet trousers pacing on their beat before every house in the village, and a small squad of prisoners, stunted and forlorn as Falstaff's ragged regiment, already in hand. I observed with delight the good demeanour of my men towards the forlorn Anglo-Saxons, and towards the more tumultuous women. Even one soldier, who threatened to throw an old termagrant into the river, took care to append the courteous epithet, Madam. I took a survey of the premises. The chief house, a pretty one with picturesque outbuildings, was that of Mrs. A., who owned the mills and lumber wharves adjoining. The wealth of these wharves had not been exaggerated. There was lumber enough to freight half a dozen steamers, and I half regretted that I had agreed to take down a freight of bricks instead. Further researches made me grateful that I had already explained to my men the difference between public foraging and private plunder. Along the river bank, I found building after building crowded with costly furniture, all neatly packed, just as it was sent up from St. Mary's when the town was abandoned. Pianos were a drug, china, glassware, mahogany pictures were all here. And here were my men, who knew that their own labour had earned for their masters these luxuries, or such as these, their own wives and children were still sleeping on the floor, perhaps at Beaufort or Ferdandina, and yet they submitted almost without a murmur to the enforced abstinence. Bed and bedding for our hospitals they might take from those storerooms, such as the surgeon selected, also an old flag which we found in a corner, and an old field piece which the regiment still possesses. But after this the doors were closed and left unmolested. It cost a struggle to some of the men whose wives were destitute, I know, but their pride was very easily touched, and when this abstinence was once recognised as a rule, they claimed it as an honour, in this and all succeeding expeditions. I flatter myself that, if they had once been set upon wholesome plundering, they would have done it as thoroughly as their betters. But I have always been infinitely grateful both for the credit and for the discipline of the regiment, as well as for the men's subsequent lives, that the opposite method was adopted. When the morning was a little advanced, I called on Mrs. A., who received me in quite a stately way at her own door with, To what am I indebted for the honour of this visit, sir? The foreign name of the family, and the tropical look of the buildings, made it seem, as indeed did all the rest of the adventure, like a chapter out of Amius Lay. But as I happened to hear that the lady herself was a Philadelphian, and her deceased husband a New Yorker, I could not feel even that modicum of reverence due to sincere Southerners. However, I wished to present my credentials, so calling up my companion, I said that I believed she had been previously acquainted with Corporal Robert Sutton. I never saw a finer bit of unutterable indignation that came over the face of my hostess, as she slowly recognised him. She drew herself up, and dropped out the monosyllables of her answer, as if they were so many drops of nitric acid. Ah, quoth my lady, we called him Bob. It was a group for a painter. The whole drama of the war seemed to reverse itself in an instant, and my tall, well-dressed, imposing, philosophic corporal dropped down the immeasurable depth into a mere plantation bob again. So at least in my imagination, not to that person himself. Too essentially dignified in his nature to be moved by words where substantial realities were in question, he simply turned from the lady, touched his hat to me, and asked if I would wish to see the slave jail, as he had the keys in his possession. If he fancied that I was in danger of being overcome by blandishments, and needed to be recalled to realities. It was a master stroke. I must say that when that door of that villainous edifice was thrown open before me, I felt glad that my main interview with the lady proprietor had passed before I saw it. It was a small building, like a northern corn barn, and seemed to be as prominent and as legitimate a place among the outbuildings of the establishment. In the middle of the door was a large staple with a rusty chain, like an ox chain, for fastening a victim down. When the door had been opened after the death of the late proprietor, my informant said, 
a man was found padlocked in that chain. We found also three pairs of stocks of various construction, two of which had smaller as well as larger holes, evidently for the feet of women or children. In a building nearby we found something far more complicated, which was perfectly unintelligible till the men explained all its parts. A machine so contrived that a person once imprisoned in it could neither sit, stand, nor lie, but must support the body half raised in a position scarcely endurable. I have since bitterly reproached myself for leaving this piece of ingenuity behind, but it would have cost much labour to remove it, and to bring away the other trophies seemed then enough. I remember the unutterable loathing with which I leaned against the door of that prison house. I had thought myself seasoned to any conceivable horrors of slavery, but it seemed as if the visible presence of that den of sin would choke me. Of course it would have been burned to the ground by us, but that this would have involved the sacrifice of every other building and all the piles of lumber, and for the moment it seemed as if the sacrifice would be righteous. But I forbore, and only took the trophies, the instruments of torture, and the keys of the jail. We found but a few coloured people in this vicinity. Some we brought away with us, and an old man and woman preferred to remain. All the white males whom we found I took as hostages, in order to shield us, if possible, from attack on our way down river, explaining to them that they would be put ashore once the dangerous points were passed. I knew that their wives could easily send notice of this fact to the rebel forces along the river. My hostages were a forlorn-looking set of crackers, far inferior to our soldiers in physique, and yet quite equal, the latter declared, to the average material of the southern armies. None were in uniform, but this proved nothing as to their being soldiers. One of them, a mere boy, was captured at his own door with gun in hand. It was a fowling piece which he used only, as his mother plaintively assured me, to shoot little birds with. As the garless youth had for this purpose loaded the gun with eighteen buckshot, we thought it justifiable to confiscate both the weapon and the owner, in mercy to the birds. We took from this place, for the use of the army, a flock of some thirty sheep, forty bushels of rice, some other provisions, tools, oars, and a little lumber, leaving all possible space for the bricks which we expected to obtain just below. I should have gone further up the river, but for a dangerous boom which kept back a great number of logs in a large brook that here fell into St. Mary's. The stream ran with force, and if the rebels had wit enough to do it, they might in ten minutes so choke the river with driftwood as infinitely to enhance our troubles. So we dropped down the stream a mile or two, found the very brickyard from which the Fort Clinch had been constructed, still stored with bricks, and seemingly unprotected. Here Sergeant Rivers again planted his standard, and the men toiled eagerly for several hours, in loading our boat to the utmost with bricks. Meanwhile we questioned black and white witnesses, and learned for the first time that the rebels admitted a repulse at Township Landing, and that Lieutenant Jones and ten of their number were killed, though this I fancy to have been an exaggeration. They have also declared that the mysterious steamer Barossa was lying at the head of the river, was but a broken-down and worthless affair, and would never get to sea. The result has since proved this, for the vessel subsequently ran the blockade and foundered near shore, the crew barely escaping with their lives. I had the pleasure, as it happened, of being the first person to forward this information to Admiral de Pont, when it came through the pickets many months after, thus concluding my report on the Barossa. Before the work at the yard was over, the pickets reported mounted men in the woods nearby, as had previously been the report at Woodstock. This admonished us to lose no time, and as we left the wharf, immediate arrangements were made to have the gun crews in all readiness, and to keep the rest of the men below, since their musketry would be of little use now, and I did not propose to risk a life unnecessarily. The chief obstacle to this was their own eagerness. Penned down on one side, they popped up on the other. Their officers, too, were eager to see what was going on, and were almost as hard to cork down as the men. Add to this that the vessel was now very crowded, and that I had to be chiefly on the hurricane deck with the pilots. Captain Clinton, master of the vessel, was brave to excess, and as much excited as the men. He could no more be kept in the little pilot house than they below, and when he had passed one or two bluffs with no sign of the enemy, he grew more and more irrepressible, and exposed himself conspicuously on the upper deck. Perhaps we were all a little lulled by the apparent safety. For myself, I lay down for a moment on a settee in a stateroom, having been on my feet almost without cessation for twenty-four hours. 
Suddenly there swept down from a bluff above us, on the Georgia side, a mingling of shout and roar and rattlers of a tornado let loose, and as a storm of bullets came pelting against the sides of the vessel and through the window, there went up a shrill answering shout from our own men. It took but an instant for me to reach the gun deck. After all my efforts the men had swarmed once more from below, and already crowding at both ends of the boat, were loading and firing with inconceivable rapidity, shouting to each other, Never give it up! and, of course, having no steady aim, as the vessel glided and whirled in the swift current. Meanwhile the officers in charge of the large guns had their crews in order, and our shells began to fly over the bluffs, which, as we now saw, should have been shelled in advance, only that we had to economise on ammunition. The other soldiers I drove below, almost by main force, with the aid of their officers, who behaved exceedingly well, giving the men leave to fire through the open portholes, which lined the lower deck almost at the water's level. In the very midst of the melee, Major Strong came from the upper deck with a face of horror, and whispered to me, Captain Clifton was killed at the first shot by my side. If he had said that the vessel was on fire, the shock would hardly have been greater. Of course, the military commander on board a steamer is almost as helpless as an unarmed man, so far as the risks of water go. A seaman must command there. In the hazardous voyage of last night, I had learned, though unjustly, to distrust every official on board the steamboat except this excitable, brave, warm-hearted sailor, and now among those added dangers to lose him? The responsibility for his life also thrilled me. He was not among my soldiers, and yet he was killed. I thought of his wife and children, of whom he had spoken, but one learns to think rapidly in war, and cautioning the Major to silence, I went up to the hurricane deck and drew in the helpless body, that it should be safe from further desecration, and then looked to see where we were. We were now gliding past a safe reach of marsh, while our assailants were riding by cross paths to attack at the next bluff. It was Reed's bluff where we were first attacked, and Scrubby bluff, I think, was next. They were shelled in advance, but swarmed manfully to the banks again as we swept round one of the sharp angles of the stream beneath their fire. My men were now pretty well imprisoned below in the hot and crowded hold, and actually fought each other, the officers said afterwards, for places at the open portholes from which to aim. Others implored to be landed, exclaiming that they supposed Decunnel knew best, but it was mighty mean, to be shut up down below when they might be fighting de secesh in de Clare Field. This clear field, and no favour, was what they thenceforward sighed for, but in such difficult navigation it would have been madness to think of landing, although one daring rebel actually sprang upon our large boat which we towed astern, where he was shot down by one of our sergeants. This boat was soon after swamped and abandoned, then taken and repaired by the rebels at a later date, and finally, by a piece of dramatic completeness, was seized by a party of fugitive slaves who escaped in it to our lines, and some of whom enlisted in our own regiment. It has always been rather a mystery to me why the rebels did not fell a few trees across the stream at some of the many sharp angles where we might so easily have thus been imprisoned. This, however, they did not attempt, and with the skilful pilotage of our trusty corporal, philosophics as Socrates through all the din, and occasionally relieving his mind by taking a shot with his rifle through the high portholes of the pilot-house, we glided safely on. The steamer did not ground once on the descent, and the mate in command, Mr. Smith, did his duty very well. The plank sheathing of the pilot-house was penetrated by a few bullets, though struck by so many outside that it was visited as a curiosity after our return, and even among the gun-crews, though they had no protection, not a man was hurt. As we approached some wooded bluff, usually on the Georgia side, we could see galloping along the hillside what seemed a regiment of mounted riflemen, and could see our shells scatter them ere we approached. Shelling did not, however, prevent a rather fierce fusillade from our old friends of Captain Dark's company at Waterman's Bluff near Township Landing. But even this did no serious damage, and this was the last. It was, of course, impossible while thus running the gauntlet to put our hostages ashore, and I could only explain to them that they must thank their own friends for the inevitable detention. I was by no means proud of their forlorn appearance, and besought Colonel Hawley to take them off my hands, but he was sending no flags of truce at that time, and liked their looks no better than I did. So I took them to Port Royal, where they were afterwards sent safely across the lines. Our men were pleased at taking them back with us, as they had already said regretfully 
Suppose we leave dem Cisesh at Fernandina. General Saxby won't see em, as if they were some new natural curiosity, which indeed they were. One soldier further suggested the expediency of keeping them permanently in camp, to be used as marks for the guns of the relieved guard every morning, but this was rather ebullient of fancy than a sober proposition. Against these levities I must put a piece of more tragic eloquence, which I took down by night on the steamer's deck from the thrilling harangue of Corporal Adam Alston, one of our most gifted prophets, whose influence over the men was unbounded. When I heard, he said, de bombshell scream in Trudy Woods like de judgment day, I said to myself, if my head was took off to-night, they couldn't put my soul in de torments, perceps except God was my enemy. And when de rifle bullets come whizzing across de deck, I cry aloud, God help me congregation, boys, load and fire. I must pass briefly over the few remaining days of our cruise. At Fernandina we met the planter, which had been successful on her separate expedition, and had destroyed the extensive salt works at Crooked River, under charge of the energetic Captain Trowbridge, efficiently aided by Captain Rogers. Our commodities being in part delivered at Fernandina, our decks being full, coal nearly out, and time up, we called once more at St. Simon's Sound, bringing away the remainder of our railroad iron, with some of which the naval officers had previously disinterred, and then steamed back to Beaufort. Arriving there at sunrise, February 2nd, 1863, I made my way with Dr. Rogers to General Saxton's bedroom, and laid before him the keys and shackles of the slave prison, with my report of the good conduct of the men, as Dr. Rogers remarked, a message from heaven and another from hell. Slight as this expedition now seems among the vast events of the war, the future student of the newspapers of that day will find that it occupied no little space in their columns, so intense was the interest which was then attached to the novel experiment of employing black troops. So obvious, too, was the value during this raid of their local knowledge and their enthusiasm, that it was impossible not to find in its successes new suggestions for the war. Certainly I would not have consented to repeat the enterprise with the bravest white troops, leaving Corporal Sutton and his mates behind, for I should have expected to fail. For a year after our raid, the Upper St. Mary's remained unvisited, till in 1864 the large force with which we held Florida secured peace upon its banks. Then Mrs. A. took the oath of allegiance, the government brought her remaining lumber, and the John Adams again ascended with a detachment of my men under Lieutenant Parker, and brought a portion of it to Fernandina. By a strange turn of fortune, Corporal Sutton, now sergeant, was at this time in jail at Hilton Head, under sentence of court-martial, for an alleged act of mutiny, an affair in which the general voice of our officers sustained him and condemned his accusers, so that he soon received a full pardon, and was restored in honour to his place in the regiment, which he has ever since held. Nothing can exaggerate the fascinations of war, whether on the largest or smallest scale. When we settled down into camp life again, it seemed like a butterfly's folding its wings to re-enter the chrysalis. None of us could listen to the crack of a gun without recalling instantly the sharp shots that spiralled down from the bluffs of St. Mary's, or hear a sudden trampling of horsemen by night without recalling the sounds which startled us on the field of the Hundred Pines. The memory of our raid was preserved in the camp by many legends of adventure, growing vaster and more incredible as time wore on, and by the morning appeals to the surgeon of some veteran invalids, who could now cut off all reproofs and suspicions with, Doctor, I's been a sickly pusson ever since de expeditious. But to me, the most vivid remembrancer was the flock of sheep which we had lifted. The post quartermaster discreetly gave us the charge of them, and they filled a gap in the landscape and in the larder, which last had before presented one unvaried round of impenetrable beef. Mr. Obadiah Oldbuck, when he decided to adopt a pastoral life and assume the provisional name of Thriasis, never looked upon his flocks and herds with more unalloyed contentment than I upon that fleecy family. I had been familiar in Kansas with the metaphor by which the sentiments of an owner were credited to his property, and had heard of a pro-slavery colt and an anti-slavery cow. The fact that these sheep were but recently converted from secesh sentiments was their crowning charm. Methought they frisked and fattened in the joy of their deliverance from the shadow of Mrs. A.'s slave jail, and gladly contemplated translation into mutton broth for sick and wounded soldiers. 
the very slaves who once, perchance, were sold at auction with yon age patriarch of the flock, had now asserted their humanity, and would devour him as hospital rations. Meanwhile, our shepherd bore a sharp bayonet with a crook, and I felt myself a peer of Ulysses and Rob Roy, those sheep-stealers of less elevated aims, when I met in my daily rides these wandering trophies of our wider wanderings. End of chapter 3 Recording by F. N. H. Visit www.bookranger.co.uk Chapter 4 of Army Life in a Black Regiment This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter 4. Up the St. John's. There was not much stirring in the Department of the South early in 1863, and the St. Mary's expedition had afforded a new sensation. Of course, the few officers of colored troops, and the larger number who wished to become such, were urgent for further experiments in the same line, and the Florida tax commissioners were urgent likewise. I well remember the morning when, after some preliminary correspondence, I steamed down from Beaufort, S.C., to Hilton Head, with General Saxton, Judge S., and one or two others, to have an interview on the matter with Major General Hunter, then commanding the department. Hilton Head, in those days, seemed always like some foreign military station in the tropics, the long, low, white buildings with piazzas and verandas on the waterside. The general impression of heat and lassitude, existence appearing to pulsate only with the sea breeze, the sandy, almost impassable streets, and the firm, level beach, on which everybody walked who could get there. All these suggested Jamaica, or the East Indies. Then the headquarters at the end of the beach, the Zouave Sentinels, the successive anterooms, the lounging aides, the good-natured and easy general, easy by habit and energetic by impulse, had all a certain air of southern languor, rather picturesque, but perhaps not altogether bracing. General Hunter received us that day, with his usual kindliness. There was a good deal of pleasant chat. Mars O'Reilly was called in to read his latest verses, and then we came to the matter in hand. Jacksonville, on the St. John's River in Florida, had been already twice taken and twice evacuated, having been occupied by Brigadier General Wright in March 1862, and by Brigadier General Brannan in October of the same year. The second evacuation was by Major General Hunter's own order, on the avowed ground that a garrison of 5,000 was needed to hold the place, and that this force could not be spared. The present proposition was to take and hold it with a brigade of less than a 1,000 men, carrying, however, arms and uniforms for twice that number, and a month's rations. The claim was that there were fewer rebel troops in the department than formerly, and that St. Mary's expedition had shown the advantage possessed by coloured troops, in local knowledge, and in the confidence of loyal blacks. It was also urged that it was worth while to risk something in the effort to hold Florida, and perhaps bring it back into the Union. My chief aim in the negotiation was to get the men into action, and that of the Florida commissioners to get them into Florida. Thus far coinciding, we could heartily cooperate, and though General Hunter made some reasonable objections, they were yielded more readily than I had feared, and finally, before half our logical ammunition was exhausted, the desired permission was given, and the thing might be considered as done. We were now to leave, as we supposed, for ever, the camp which had thus far been our home. Our vast amount of surplus baggage made a heavy job in the loading, insomuch as we had no wharf, and everything had to be put on board by the means of flat boats. It was completed by twenty-four hours of steady work, and after some of the usual uncomfortable delays which wait on military expeditions, we were at last afloat. I had tried to keep the plan as secret as possible, and had requested to have no definite orders until we should be on board ship. But this larger expedition was less within my own hands than was the St. Mary's affair, 
and the great reliance for concealment was on certain counter-reports ingeniously set afloat by some of the Florida men. These reports rapidly swelled into the most enormous tales, and by the time they reached the New York newspapers, the expedition was a great volcano about bursting, whose lava will burn, flow, and destroy. The sudden appearance in arms of no less than five thousand negroes, a liberating host, not the phantom, but the reality of servile insurrection. What the undertaking actually was may be best seen in the instructions which guided it. March 5th, 1863. Colonel, you will please proceed with your command the 1st and 2nd Regiment South Carolina Volunteers, which are now embarked upon steamers John Adams, Boston's and Burnside, to Fernandina, Florida. Relying upon your military skill and judgment, I shall give you no special directions as to your procedure after you leave Fernandina. I expect, however, that you will occupy Jacksonville, Florida, and entrench yourselves there. The main objects of your expedition are to carry the proclamation of the freedom to the enslaved, to call all loyal men to the service of the United States, to occupy as much of the state of Florida as possible with the forces under your command, and to neglect no means consistent with the usages of civilized warfare to weaken, harass, and annoy those who are in rebellion against the government of the United States. Trusting that the blessing of our Heavenly Father will rest upon your noble enterprise, I am yours sincerely, R. Saxton, Brigadier General Military Governor, Department of the South, Colonel Higginson, Commanding Expeditionary Corps. In due time, after touching at Fernandina, we reached the difficult bar of the St. John's, and were piloted safely over. Admiral Dupont had furnished a courteous letter of introduction, and we were cordially received by Commander Dukin of the Norwich and Lieutenant Watson, commanding the Uncas. Flagship Wabash, Port Royal Harbour, S.C., March 6, 1863. Sir, I am informed by Major General Hunter that he is sending Colonel Higginson on an important mission in the southerly part of this department. I have not been made acquainted with the objects of this mission, but any assistance that you can offer Colonel Higginson, which will not interfere with your other duties, you are authorized to give. Respectfully, your obedient servant, S.F. DuPont, Rear Admiral Commanding S. ATL Block Squad, to the senior officer at the different blockading stations on the coast of Georgia and Florida. Like all officers on blockade duty, they were impatient of their enforced inaction, and gladly seized the opportunity for a different service. It was some time since they had ascended as high as Jacksonville, for their orders were strict. One vessel's coal was low, the other was in infirm condition and there were rumours of cotton-clads and torpedoes. But they gladly agreed to escort us up the river, so soon as our own armed gunboat, the John Adams, should arrive, she being unaccountably delayed. We waited twenty-four hours for her, at the sultry mouth of that glassy river, watching the great pelicans which floated lazily on its tide, or sometimes shooting one, to admire the great pouch into which one of the soldiers could insert his foot, as into a boot. He hold one quart, said the admiring experimentalist. Hi, boy, he reported another quickly. Never you bring dat quart measure in my peck of corn. The protest came very promptly, and was certainly fair, for the strange receptacle would have held nearly a gallon. We went on shore, too, and were shown a rather pathetic little garden, which the naval officers had laid out, indulging a dream of vegetables. They lingered over their little microscopic sprouts, pointing them out tenderly, as if they were cradled babies. I have often noticed this touching weakness in gentlemen of that profession on lonely stations. We wandered among the bluffs, too, in the little deserted hamlet called Pilot Town. The ever-shifting sand had in some cases almost buried the small houses, and had swept around others in a circular drift, at a few yards' distance overtopping their eaves, and leaving each the untouched citadel of this natural redoubt. There was also a dismantled lighthouse, an object which seems the most dreary symbol of the barbarism of war, when one considers the national beneficence which reared and kindled it. Despite the service rendered by this once brilliant light, there were many wrecks which had been strewn upon the beach, victims of the most formidable of the southern river bars. As I stood with my foot on the half-buried ribs of one of these vessels, so distinctly traced that one might almost fancy them human, the old pilot, my companion, told me the story of the wreck. The vessel had formerly been in the Cuba trade, and her owner, 
an American merchant residing in Havana, had christened her for his young daughter. I asked the name, and was startled to recognize that of a favorite young cousin of mine, besides the bones of whose representative I was thus strangely standing upon this lonely shore. It was well to have something to relieve the anxiety naturally felt at the delay of the John Adams, anxiety both for her safety and for the success of our whole enterprise. The rebels had repeatedly threatened to burn the whole of Jacksonville in case of another attack, and they had previously burned its mills and its great hotel. It seemed as if the news of our arrival must surely have travelled thirty miles by this time. All day we watched every smoke that rose among the wooded hills, and consulted the compass and the map, to see if that sign announced the doom of our expected home. At the very last moment of the tide, just in time to cross the bar that day, the missing vessel arrived. All anxieties vanished. I transferred my quarters on board, and at two the next morning we steamed up the river. Again there was the dreamy delight of ascending an unknown stream beneath a sinking moon, into a region where peril made fascination. Since the time of the first explorers, I suppose that those southern waters have known no sensation so dreamy and so bewitching as those which this war has brought forth. I recall in this case the faintest sensations of our voyage. Once Ponce de Leon may have recalled those of his wandering search in the same soft zone for the secret of the mystic fountain. I remember how, during that night, I looked for the first time through a powerful night glass. It has always seemed a thing wholly inconceivable that a mere lens could change darkness into light, and as I turned the instrument on the preceding gunboat and actually discerned the man at the wheel and the others standing about him, all relapsing into a vague gloom again at the withdrawal of the glass, it gave a feeling of childish delight. Yet it seemed only in keeping with the whole enchantment of the scene, and had I been some Aladdin, conveyed by genie or giants, I could hardly have felt more wholly a denzin of some world of romance. But the river was a difficult navigation, and we began to feel sometimes beneath the keel that ominous, sliding, grating, treacherous arrest of motion which makes the heart shudder as the vessel does. There was some solicitude about torpedoes, also a peril which became a formidable thing one year later, in the very channel where we found none. Soon one of our consorts grounded, and then another, every vessel taking its turn, I believe, and then in turn getting off, until the Norwich lay hopelessly stranded for that tide at least, a few miles below Jacksonville and out of sight of the city, so that she could not even add to our dignity by her visible presence from afar. This was rather a serious matter, as the Norwich was our main naval reliance, the Uncas being a small steamer of less than two hundred tons, and in such poor condition that Commander Dukan, on finding himself aground, at first quite declined to trust his consort any farther alone. But having got thus far, it was plainly my duty to risk the remainder with or without naval assistance, and this being so, the courageous officer did not long object, but allowed his dashing subordinate to steam up with us to the city. This left us one naval and one army gunboat, Unfortunately, the Burnside, being a black propeller, always passed for an armed vessel among the rebels, and we rather encouraged that pleasing illusion. We had aimed to reach Jacksonville at daybreak, but these mishaps delayed us, and we had several hours of fresh, early sunshine, lighting up the green shores of that lovely river, wooded to the water's edge, with sometimes an emerald meadow, opening a vista to some picturesque house, all utterly unlike anything we had yet seen in the south, and suggesting rather the Penospicot or the Kennebuck. Here and there we glided by the ruins of some sawmill burned by the rebels on the General Wright's approach, but nothing else spoke of war, except perhaps the silence. It was a delicious day, and a scene of fascination. Our Florida men were wild with delight, and when we rounded the point below the city, and saw from afar its long streets, its brick warehouses, its white cottages, and its overshadowing trees, all peaceful and undisturbed by flames, it seemed in the men's favourite phrase, too much good, and all discipline was merged for the moment in a buzz of ecstasy. The city was still there for us at any rate, though none knew what perils might be concealed behind those quiet buildings. Yet there were children playing on the wharves, careless men here and there lounged down to look at us, hands in pockets, a few women came to their doors, 
and gazed listlessly upon us, shading their eyes with their hands. We drew momentarily nearer, in silence and with breathless attention. The gunners were at their posts, and the men in line. It was eight o'clock. We were now directly opposite the town, yet no sign of danger was seen. Not a rifle shot was heard. Not a shell rose hissing into the air. The Uncas rounded to, and dropped anchor in the stream. By previous agreement, I steamed to an upper pier of the town, Colonel Montgomery to a lower one. The little boat howitzers were run out upon the wharves, and presently to the angles of the chief streets, and the pretty town was our own without a shot. In spite of our detention, the surprise had been complete, and not a soul in Jacksonville had dreamed of our coming. The day passed quickly, in eager preparations for defence. The people could or would give us no definite information about the rebel camp, which was, however, known to be near, and our force did not permit our going out to surprise it. The night following was the most anxious I ever spent. We were all tired out. The companies were under arms in various parts of the town to be ready for an attack at any moment. My temporary quarters were beneath the loveliest grove of linden trees, and as I reclined half dozing, the mockingbirds sang all night like nightingales, their notes seeming to trickle down through the sweet air from amid the blossoming boughs. Day brought relief and the sense of due possession, and we could see what we had won. Jacksonville was now a United States post again, the only post on the mainland in the Department of the South. Before the war, it had three or four thousand inhabitants and a rapidly growing lumber trade, for which abundant facilities were evidently provided. The wharves are capricious, and the blocks of brick warehouses along the lower street were utterly unlike anything we had yet seen in that region, as were the neatness and thrift everywhere visible. It had been built up by the Northern Enterprise, and much of the property was owned by loyal men. It had been a great resort for invalids, though the rebels had burned the large hotel which had once accommodated them. Mills had also been burned, but the dwelling houses were almost all in good condition. The quarters for the men were admirable, and I took official possession of a handsome brick house of Colonel Sunderland, the established headquarters through every occupation, whose accommodating flag staff had literally and repeatedly changed its colours. The seceded colonel, reputed author of the state ordinance of secession, was a New Yorker by birth, and we found his law card, issued when in practice in eastern Washington County, New York. He certainly had good taste in planning the inside of a house, though time had impaired its condition. There was a neat office with ample bookcases and no books, a billiard table with no balls, gas fixtures without gas, and a bathing room without water. There was a separate building for servants' quarters, and a kitchen with every convenience, even to a few jars of lingering pickles. On the whole, there was an air of substance and comfort about the town, quite alien from the picturesque decadence of Beaufort. The town rose gradually from the river, and was bounded on the rear by a long sluggish creek, beyond which lay a stretch of woods affording an excellent covert for the enemy, but without great facilities for attack, as there were but two or three fords and bridges. This brook could easily be held against a small force, but could at any time and almost at any point be readily crossed by a large one. North of the town, the land rose a little between the river and the sources of the brook, and then sank to a plain which had been partially cleared by a previous garrison. For so small a force as ours, however, this clearing must be extended nearer to the town, otherwise our lines would be too long for our numbers. This deficiency in numbers at once became a source of serious anxiety. While planning the expedition, it had seemed so important to get the men a foothold in Florida that I was willing to risk everything for it. But this important post once in our possession, it began to show some analogies to the proverbial elephant in the lottery. To hold it permanently with nine hundred men was not, perhaps, impossible, with the aid of a gunboat. I had left many of my own regiments sick and on duty in Beaufort, and Colonel Montgomery had as yet less than one hundred and fifty. But to hold it, and also to make forays up the river, certainly required a larger number. We came in part to recruit, but have found scarcely an able-bodied negro in the city. All had been removed farther up, and we must certainly contrive to follow them. I was very unwilling to have, as yet, any white troops under my command with the blacks. Finally, however, being informed by Judge S. of a conversation with Colonel Hawley, commanding at Fernandina, 
in which the latter had offered to send four companies of a light battery to swell our force. In view of the aid given to his position by this more advanced post, I decided to authorize the energetic judge to go back to Fernandina and renew the negotiation, as the John Adams must go thither at any rate for coal. Meanwhile, all definite display of our force was avoided. Dress parades were omitted, the companies were so distributed as to tell for the utmost, and the judicious use was made here and there of empty tents. The gunboats and transports moved impressively up and down the river from time to time. The disposition of pickets was varied each night to perplex the enemy, and some advantage taken of his distrust, which might be assumed as equalling our own. The citizens were duly impressed by our supply of ammunition, which was really enormous, and all these things soon took effect. A loyal woman who came into town, said that the rebel scouts, stopping at her house, reported that there were sixteen hundred negroes all over the woods, and the town full of them besides. It was of no use to go in. General Finnegan had driven them into a bad place once, and should not do it again. They had lost their captain, and their best surgeon in the first skirmish, and if the Savannah people wanted the negroes driven away, they might come and do it themselves. Unfortunately, we knew that they could come easily from Savannah at any time, as there was railroad communication nearly all the way, and every time we heard the steam whistle, the men were convinced of their arrival. Thus, we never could approach to any certainty as to their numbers, while they could observe from the bluffs every steamboat that ascended the river. To render our weak force still more available, we barricaded the approaches to the chief streets by constructing barriers or felling trees. It went to my heart to sacrifice for this purpose several of my beautiful lindens, but it was no time for aesthetics. As the giants lay on the ground, still scenting the air with their abundant bloom, I used to rein up my horse and watch the children playing hide-and-seek amongst their branches, or some quiet cow grazing at the foliage. Nothing impresses the mind in war like some occasional object or association that belongs apparently to peace alone. Among all these solicitudes, it was a great thing that one particular anxiety vanished in a day. On the former expedition, the men were upon trial as to their courage. Now they were to endure another test, as to their demeanour as victors. Here were five hundred citizens, nearly all white, at the mercy of their former slaves. To some of these whites, it was the last crowning humiliation, and they were, or professed to be, in perpetual fear. On the other hand, the most intelligent and ladylike woman I saw, the wife of a rebel captain, rather surprised me, by saying that it seemed pleasanter to have these men stationed there, whom they had known all their lives, and who had generally borne a good character, than to be in the power of entire strangers. Certainly the men deserved the confidence, for there was scarcely an exception to their good behaviour. I think they thoroughly felt their honour and their dignity were concerned in the matter, and took too much pride in their character as soldiers, to say nothing of higher motives, to tarnish it by any misdeeds. They watched their officers, vigilantly, and even suspiciously, to detect any disposition towards compromise, and so long as we pursued a just course, it was evident that they could be relied on. Yet the spot was pointed out to me where two of our leading men had seen their brothers hanged by lynch law. Many of them had private wrongs to avenge, and they all had utter disbelief in all pretended loyalty, especially on the part of the women. One citizen alone was brought to me in a sort of escort of honour by Corporal Prince Lamkin, one of the colour guard, and one of the ablest men, the same who had once made a speech in camp, reminding his hearers that they had lived under the American flag for 1862 years, and ought to live and die under it. Corporal Lamkin now introduced his man, a German, with the highest compliment in his power. He had a true coloured man heart. Surrounded by mean, cajoling, insinuating white men and women, who were all that and worse, I was quite ready to appreciate the quality he thus proclaimed. A coloured man heart, in the rebel states, is a fair synonym for a loyal heart, and it is about the only such synonym. In this case, I found afterwards that the man in question, a small grocer, had been the object of suspicion to the whites from his readiness to lend money to the negroes, or sell to them on credit, in which, perhaps, there may have been some mixture of self-interest with benevolence. I resort to a notebook of that period, well-thumbed and pocket-worn, which sometimes received a fragment of the day's experience. 
March 16, 1863. Of course, droll things are constantly occurring. Every white man, woman, and child is flattering, seductive, and profess union sentiment. Every black ditto believes that every white ditto is a scoundrel, and ought to be shot, but for good order and military discipline. The provost marshal and I steer between them as blandly as we can. Such scenes as succeed each other. Rush of indignant Africans. A white man in woman's clothes has been seen to enter a certain house, undoubtedly a spy. Further evidence discloses the Roman Catholic priest, a peaceful little Frenchman, in his professional apparel. Anxious female enters. Some sentinel has shot her cow by mistake for a rebel. The United States cannot think of paying the desired thirty dollars. Let her go to the post quartermaster and select a cow from his herd. If there is none to suit her, and indeed not one of them gave a drop of milk, neither did hers, let her wait till the next lot comes in. That is all. Yesterday's operation gave the following total yield. Thirty contrabands, eighteen horses, eleven cattle, ten saddles and bridles, and one new army wagon. At this rate we shall soon be self-supporting cavalry. Where complaints are made of the soldiers, it almost always turns out that the women have insulted them most grossly, swearing at them and the like. One old unpleasant Dutch woman came in, bursting with wrath, and told the whole narrative of her blameless life, diversified with sobs. Last January I ran off two of the black people from St. Mary's to Fernandina, sob. Then I moved down there myself, and at Lake City I lost six women and a boy, sob. And then I stopped at Baldwin for one of the wenches to be confined, sob. Then I brought them all here to live in a Christian country, sob, sob. Then the blockheads, blockades, that is, gunboats, came and they all ran off with the blockheads, sob, sob, sob and left me an old lady of forty-six obliged to work for a living, a chaos of sobs, without cessation. But when I found out what the old sinner had said to the soldiers, I rather wondered at their self-control in not throttling her. Meanwhile, skirmishing went on daily in the outskirts of the town. There was a fight on the very first day, when our men killed, as before hinted, a rebel surgeon, which was oddly metamorphosed in the southern newspapers into theirs killing one of ours which certainly never happened. Every day after this, they appeared in small mounted squads in the neighbourhood, and exchanged shots with our pickets, to which the gunboats would contribute their louder share, their aim being rather embarrassed by the woods and hills. We made reconnaissances, too, to learn the country in different directions, and were apt to be fired upon during these. Along the farther side of what we called the debatable land, there was a line of cottages, hardly superior to the negro huts, and almost all empty, where the rebel pickets resorted, and from whose windows they fired. By degrees all these nests were broken up and destroyed, though it cost some trouble to do it, and the hottest skirmishes usually took place around them. Among these little affairs was one which we called Company K's Skirmish, because it brought out the fact that this company, which was composed entirely of South Carolina men, and had never shone in drill or discipline, stood near the head of the regiment for coolness and courage the defect of discipline showing itself only in their extreme unwillingness to halt when once we let loose. It was at this time that the small comedy of the goose occurred, an anecdote which Wendell Phillips has since made his own. One of the advancing line of skirmishers, usually an active fellow enough, was observed to move clumsily and irregularly. It soon appeared that he had encountered a fine specimen of the domestic goose, which had surrendered at discretion. Not wishing to lose it, he could yet find no way to hold it but between his legs, and so he went on, loading, firing, advancing, halting, always with the goose writhing and struggling and hissing at this natural pair of stocks. Both happily came off unwounded, and retired in good order at the signal, or some time after it, but I have hardly a cooler thing to put on record. Meanwhile, another fellow left the field less exultingly, for after a thoroughly courageous share in the skirmish, he came blubbering to his captain and said, Cap'n, Make Caesar give me my cane. It seemed that, during some interval of the fighting, he had helped himself to an armful of rebel sugar cane, such as they all delighted in chewing. The Roman hero, during another pause, had confiscated the treasure, whence these tears of the returning warrior. I never could accustom myself to these extraordinary interminglings of manly and childish attributes. Our most untiring scout during this period was the chaplain of my regiment, the most restless and daring spirit we had. 
and now exulting in full liberty of action. He it was who was daily permitted to stray singly where no other officer would have been allowed to go. So irresistible was his appeal. You know, I am only a chaplain. Methinks I see our regimental saint with pistols in his belt and a ballard rifle slung on shoulder, putting spurs to his steed and cantering away down some questionable wood path or returning with some tale of rebel haunt discovered or store of foraging. He would track an enemy like an Indian, or exhort him when apprehended like an early Christian. Some of our devout soldiers shook their heads sometimes over the chaplain's little eccentricities. "'What for Mr. Chapman made a preacher for?' said one of them as usual, transforming his title into a patronomic. "'He's de fightingest more Yankee I ever see in all my days.' And the criticism was very natural, though they could not deny that, when the hour for Sunday service came, Mr. F. commanded the respect and attention of all. That hour never came, however, on our first Sunday in Jacksonville. We were too busy and the men too scattered. So the chaplain made his accustomed foray beyond the lines instead. "'Is it not Sunday?' slyly asked the unregenerate lieutenant. "'Nay,' quoth his reverence, waxing fervid. "'It is the day of judgment.' This reminds me of a raid up the river, conducted by one of our senior captains, an enthusiast whose grey beard and prophetic manner always took me back to the fifth monarchy men. He was most successful that day, bringing back horses, cattle, provisions, and prisoners, and one of the latter complained bitterly of being held, stating that Captain R. had promised his speedy liberty. But that doughty official spurned the imputation of such weak blandishments in his day of triumphant retribution. "'Promise him,' said he. "'I promised him nothing but the day of judgment and periods of damnation.' Often since I have rolled beneath my tongue this savoury and solemn sentence, and I do not believe that since the days of the long Parliament there has been a more resounding athema. In Colonel Montgomery's hands these up-river raids reached the dignity of a fine art. His conceptions of foraging were rather more western and liberal than mine, and on these excursions he fully indemnified himself for any undue abstinence demanded of him when in camp. I remember being on the wharf with some naval officers, when he came down from his first trip. The steamer seemed an animated hen-coop. Live poultry hung from the foremast shrouds, dead ones from the mainmast, geese hissed from the binnacle, a pig raced the quarter-deck, and a duck's wings were seen fluttering from a line which was wont to sustain duck trousers. The naval heroes, mindful of their own short rations, and taking high views of one's duties in a conquered country, looked at me reproachfully, as who should say, Shall these things be? In a moment or two the returning foragers had landed. "'Captain,' blank, said Montgomery courteously, "'would you allow me to send a remarkably fine turkey for your use on board?' "'Lieutenant,' blank, said Major Corwin, "'may I ask your acceptance of a pair of ducks for your mess?' Never did I behold more cordial relations between army and navy than sprang into existence at these sentences. So true it is, as Charles Lamb says, that a single present of game may diffuse kindly sentiments through a whole community. These little trips were called rest. There was no other rest during those ten days. An immense amount of picket and fatigue duty had to be done. Two redoubts were to be built to command the northern valley. All the intervening grove, which now afforded lurking ground for a daring enemy, must be cleared away, and a few houses must be reluctantly raised for the same purpose. The fort on the left was named Fort Higginson, and that built by my own regiment in return, Fort Montgomery. The former was necessarily a hasty work, and is now, I believe, in ruins. The latter was far more elaborately constructed, on lines well traced by the 4th New Hampshire during the previous occupation. It did great credit to Captain Trowbridge of my regiment, formerly of the New York Volunteer Engineers, who had charge of its construction. How like a dream seems now that period of daily skirmishes and nightly watchfulness! The fatigue was so constant that the days hurried by. I felt the need of some occasional change of ideas, and having just received from the North Mr. Brooks' beautiful translation of John Paul's Titan, I used to retire to my bedroom for some ten minutes every afternoon and read a chapter or two. It was more refreshing than a nap, and will always be to me one of the most fascinating books in the world with this added association. After all, what concerned me was not so much the fear of an attempt to drive us out and retake the city, for that would be against the whole policy of the rebels in that region, 
as of an effort to fulfill their threats and burn it by some nocturnal dash. The most valuable buildings belonged to Union men, and the upper part of the town, built chiefly of resinous pine, was combustible to the last degree. In case of fire, if the wind blew towards the river, we might lose steamers and all. I remember regulating my degree of disrobing by the direction of the wind. If it blew from the river, it was safe to make oneself quite comfortable. If otherwise, it was best to confirm to Sawara's idea of luxury and take off one spur. So passed our busy life for ten days. There were no tidings of reinforcements, and I hardly knew whether I wished for them, or rather, I desired them as a choice of evils, for our men were giving out from overwork, and the recruiting excursions for which we had mainly come were hardly possible. At the utmost I had asked for the addition of four companies and a light battery. Judge of my surprise when two infantry regiments successfully arrived. I must resort to a scrap from the diary. Perhaps diaries are apt to be thought tedious, but I would rather read a page of one, whatever the events described, than any more deliberate narrative. It gives glimpses so much more real and vivid. Headquarters, Jacksonville. March 20th, 1863. Midnight. For the last twenty-four hours we have been sending women and children out of town, in answer to a demand by flag of truce, with a threat of bombardment. Notebook. I advised them not to go, and the majority declined doing so. It was designed, no doubt, to intimidate, and in our ignorance of the force actually outside, we have had to recognize the possibility of danger and work hard at our defenses. At any time, by going into the outskirts, we can have a skirmish, which is nothing but fun, but when night closes in over a small, weary garrison, there sometimes steals into the mind like a chill, that most sickening of all sensations, the anxiety of a commander. This was the night generally set for an attack, if any, though I'm pretty well satisfied that they have not strength to dare it, and the worst they could probably do is to burn the town. But tonight, instead of enemies, appear friends, our devoted civic ally, Judge S., and a whole Connecticut regiment, the 6th, under Major Meeker, and though the latter are aground, twelve miles below, yet they enable one to breathe more freely. I only wish they were black. But now I have to show not only that blacks can fight, but that they and white soldiers can act in harmony together. That evening the enemy came up for a reconnaissance, in the deepest darkness, and there were alarms all night. The next day the 6th Connecticut got afloat, and came up river, and two days after, to my continued amazement, arrived a part of the 8th Maine under Lieutenant Colonel Twitchell. This increased my command to four regiments, or parts of regiments, half white, half black. Skirmishing had almost ceased, our defences being tolerably complete, and looking from without much more effective than they really were. We were safe from any attack by a small force, and hoped that the enemy could not spare a large one from Charleston or Savannah. All looked bright without, and gave leisure for some small anxieties within. It was the first time in the war, so far as I know, that white and black soldiers had served together on regular duty. Jealousy was still felt towards even the officers of coloured regiments, and any difficult contingency would be apt to bring it out. The white soldiers, just from shipboard, felt a natural desire to stray about the town, and no attack from an enemy would be so disastrous as the slightest collision between them and the black provost guard. I shudder, even now, to think of the train of consequences, bearing on the whole course of the subsequent national events, which one such mishap might have produced. It is almost impossible for us now to remember in what a delicate balance then hung the whole question of negro enlistments, and consequently of slavery. Fortunately for my own serenity, I had great faith in the intrinsic power of military discipline, and also knew that a common service would soon produce a mutual respect among the good soldiers, and so it proved. But the first twelve hours of this mixed command were to me a more anxious period than any outward alarms had created. Let us resort to the notebook again. Jacksonville, March 22nd, 1863 It is Sunday. The bell is ringing for church, and Reverend Mr. F. from Beaufort is to preach. This afternoon our good quartermaster establishes a Sunday school for our little colony of contrabands, now numbering seventy. Sunday afternoon. The bewildering report is confirmed, and in addition to the 6th Connecticut, which came yesterday, appears part of the 8th Maine, 
The remainder, with its colonel, will be here tomorrow, and, report says, Major General Hunter. Now my hope is that we may go to some point higher up the river, which we can hold for ourselves. There are two other points, Magnolia and Palatka, which in themselves are as favorable as this, and for getting recruits better. So I shall hope to be allowed to go, to take posts, and then let white troops garrison them. That is my program. What makes the thing more puzzling is that the 8th Maine has only brought ten days' rations, so that they evidently are not here to stay, and yet where they go, or why they come, is a puzzle. Meanwhile, we can sleep sounder nights, and if the black and white babies do not quarrel and pull hair, we shall do very well. Colonel Rust, on arriving, said frankly that he knew nothing of the plans prevailing in the department, but that General Hunter was certainly coming soon to act for himself, that it had been reported in the North, and even at Port Royal, that we had all been captured and shot. And, indeed, I had afterwards the pleasure of reading my own obituary in the Northern Democratic Journal, and that we certainly needed reinforcements, that he himself had been sent with orders to carry out, so far as possible, the original plans of the expedition, that he regarded himself as only a visitor, and should remain chiefly on shipboard, which he did. He would relieve the black provost guard by a white one, if I approved, which I certainly did, but he said that he felt bound to give the chief opportunities of action to the colored troops, which I also approved, and which he carried out not quite to the satisfaction of his own eager and daring officers. I recall one of these enterprises, out of which we extracted a good deal of amusement. It was baptized the Battle of the Clothesline. A white company was out scouting in the woods behind the town, with one of my best Florida men for a guide, and the captain sent back a message that he had discovered a rebel camp with twenty-two tents beyond a creek about four miles away. The officers and men had been distinctly seen, and it would be quite possible to capture it. Colonel Rust at once sent me out with two hundred men to do the work, recalling the original scouts and disregarding the appeals of his own eager officers. We marched through the open pine woods on a delightful afternoon and met the returning party. Poor fellows, I shall never forget the longing eyes they cast on us as we marched forth to the field of glory from which they were debarred. We went three or four miles out, sometimes halting to send forward a scout, while I made all the men lie down in the long, thin grass and beside the fallen trees, till one could not imagine that there was a person there. I remember how picturesque the effect was, when at the signal all rose again, like Roderick Durer's men, the green wood appeared suddenly populous with armed life. At a certain point forces were divided, and a detachment was sent round the head of the creek to flank the unsuspecting enemy. While we, of the main body, stealing with caution nearer and nearer through the ever denser woods, swooped down at last in triumph upon a solitary farmhouse, where the family washing line had been hung out to dry. This was the rebel camp. It is due to Sergeant Green, my invaluable guide, to say that he had from the beginning discouraged any high hopes of crossing of bayonets. He had early explained that it was not he who had claimed to have seen tents and the rebel soldiers, but one of the officers, and had pointed out that our undisturbed approach was hardly reconcilable with the existence of a hostile camp so near. The impression had been pressed more and more upon my own mind, but it was our business to put that thing beyond a doubt. Probably the place may have occasionally been used for picket station, and we found fresh horse tracks in the vicinity, and there was a quantity of iron bridle bits in the house, of which no clear explanation could be given, so that the armed men may not have been wholly imaginary. But camp there was none. After enjoying to the utmost the fun of the thing, therefore we borrowed the only horse on the premises, hung all the bits over his neck, and as I rode him back to camp they clanked like broken chains. We were joined on the way by our dear and devoted surgeon, whom I had left behind as an invalid, but who had mounted his horse and ridden out alone to attend to our wounded, his green sash looking quite in harmony with the early spring venture of those lovely woods. So came we, back in triumph, enjoying the joke all the more, because someone else was responsible. We mystified the little community at first, but soon let out the secret, and witticisms abounded for a day or two, the mildest of which was the assertion that the author of the alarm must have been three sheets to the wind. Another expedition was of more exciting character. 
For several days before the arrival of Colonel Rust, a reconnaissance had been planned in the direction of the enemy's camp, and he finally consented to it being carried out. By the energy of Major Corwin, of the 2nd South Carolina Volunteers, aided by Mr. Holden, then a gunner on the Paul Jones, and afterwards made captain of the same regiment, one of the ten-pound parrot guns had been mounted on a hand-cart for use on the railway. This it was now proposed to bring into service. I took a large detail of men from the two white regiments, and from my own, and had instructions to march as far as the four-mile station on the railway, if possible, examine the country, and ascertain if the rebel camp had been removed, as was reported, beyond that distance. I was forbidden going any further from camp, or attacking the rebel camp, as my force comprised half the garrison, and should the town meanwhile be attacked from any other direction, it would be in great danger. I shall never forget the delight of that march through the open pine barren, with occasional patches of uncertain swamp. The 8th Maine, under Lieutenant Colonel Twitchell, was on the right, the 6th Connecticut, under Major Meeker, on the left, and my own men, under Major Strong, in the centre, having in charge the cannon to which they had been trained. Mr. Heron, from the John Adams, acted as a gunner. The mounted rebel pickets retired before us through the woods, keeping usually beyond range of the skirmishers, who in a long line, white, black, white, were deployed transversely. For the first time I saw the two colours fairly alternate on the military chessboard. It had been the object of much labour and many dreams, and I liked the pattern at last. Nothing was said about the novel fact by anybody. It all seemed to come as a matter of course. There appeared to be no mutual distrust among the men, and as for the officers, doubtless, each crow thought its own young the whitest. I certainly did, although doing full justice to the eager courage of the northern portion of my command. Especially, I watched with pleasure the fresh delight of the main men, who had not, like the rest, been previously in action, and who strode rapidly on their long legs, irresistibly recalling as their gaunt athletic frames and sunburnt faces appeared here and there among the pines, the lumber regions of their native state, with which I was not unfamiliar. We passed through a former camp of the rebels, from which everything had been lately removed, but when the utmost permitted limits of our reconnaissance were reached, there were still no signs of any other camp, and the rebel cavalry still kept provoking before us. Their evident object was to lure us on to their own stronghold, and had we fallen into the trap, it would perhaps have resembled, on a smaller scale, the Alstee of the following year. With a good deal of reluctance, however, I caused the recall to be sounded, and after a slight halt, we began to retrace our steps. Straining our eyes to look along the reach of the level railway, which stretched away through the pine barren, we began to see certain ominous puffs of smoke, which might indeed proceed from some fire in the woods but were at once set down by the men as coming from the mysterious locomotive battery which the rebels were said to have constructed. Gradually the smoke grew denser, and appeared to be moving up along the track, keeping pace with our motion, and about two miles distant. I watched it steadily through the field glass from our own slowly moving battery. It seemed to move when we moved, and to halt when we halted. Sometimes in the dun smoke I caught a glimpse of something blacker, raised high in the air, like the threatening head of some great gliding serpent. Suddenly there came a sharp puff of lighter smoke that seemed like a forked tongue, and then a hollow report, and we could see a great black projectile hurled into the air and falling a quarter of a mile away from us in the woods. I did not at once learn that this first shot killed two of the main men and wounded two more. This was fired wide, but the numerous shots which followed were admirably aimed, and seldom failed to fall or explode close to our own smaller battery. It was the first time that the men had been seriously exposed to artillery fire, a danger more exciting to the ignorant mind than any other, as this very war has shown. Footnote. Take this, for example. The effect was electrical. The rebels were the best men in Ford's command, being Lieutenant Colonel Showwater's Californians, and they are brave men. They had dismounted and sent their horses to the rear, and were undoubtedly determined upon a desperate fight, and their superior numbers made them confident of success. But they never fought with artillery, and a cannon was more terror for them than ten thousand rifles and all the wild Comanches on the plains of Texas. At the first glimpse of the shining brass monsters, there was a visible wavering in the determined front of the enemy, 
and as the shells came screaming over their heads, the scare was complete. They broke ranks, fled for their horses, scrambled on the first that came to hand, and skedaddled in the direction of Brownsville. The New York Evening Post, September 25th, 1864. End of footnote. So, I watched them anxiously. Fortunately, there were deep trenches on each side of the railway, with many stout, projecting routes, forming very tolerable bomb-proofs for those who happened to be near them. The enemy's gun was a 64-pound Blakely, as we afterwards found, whose enormous projectile moved very slowly and gave ample time to cover, insomuch that, while the fragments of the shell fell all around and amongst us, not a man was hurt. This soon gave the men the most buoyant confidence, and they shouted with childish delight over every explosion. The moment a shell had burst, or fallen unburst, our little gun was invariably fired in return, and that with some precision, so far as we could judge, its range also being nearly as great. For some reason they showed no disposition to overtake us, in which attempt their locomotive would have given them an immense advantage over our heavy hand-car, and their cavalry force over our infantry. Nevertheless, I rather hoped that they would attempt it, for then an effort might have been made to cut them off in the rear by taking up some rails. As it was, this was out of the question, though they moved slowly as we moved, keeping always about two miles away. When they finally ceased firing, we took up the rails beyond us before withdrawing, and thus kept the enemy from approaching so near the city again. But I shall never forget that Dantean monster rearing its black head amid the distant smoke, nor the solicitude with which I watched for the puff which meant danger, and looked round to see if my chickens were all under cover. The greatest peril, after all, was from the possible dismounting of our gun, in which case we should have been very apt to lose it, if the enemy had showed any dash. There may be other such tilts of railway artillery on record during the war, but if so, I have not happened to read of them, and so have dwelt the longer on this. This was doubtless the same locomotive battery which had previously fired more than once upon the town, running up to within two miles, and then withdrawing, while it was deemed inexpedient to destroy the railroad on our part, lest it might be needed by ourselves in turn. One night, too, the rebel threat had been fulfilled, and they had shelled the town with the same battery. They had the range well, and every shot fell near the post headquarters. It was exciting to see the great Blakely shell showing a light as it rose, and moving slowly towards us like a comet, then exploding and scattering its formidable fragments. Yet, strange to say, no serious harm was done to life or limb, and the most formidable casualty was that of a citizen who complained that a shell had passed through the wall of his bedroom and carried off his mosquito curtain in his transit. Little knew we how soon these small entertainments would be over. Colonel Montgomery had gone up the river with two companies, perhaps to remain permanently, and I was soon to follow. On Friday, March 27th, I wrote home. The Burnside has gone to Beaufort for rations, and the John Adams to Fernandina for coal. We expect both back by Sunday, and on Monday I hope to get the regiment off to a point further up, Magnolia, 35 miles, or Pilatka, 75, either of which would be a good post for us. General Hunter is expected every day, and it is strange he has not come. The very next day came an official order recalling the whole expedition, and for the third time evacuating Jacksonville. A council of military and naval officers was at once called, though there was but one thing to be done, and the latter were even more disappointed and amazed than the former. This was especially the case with the senior naval officer, Captain Steadman, a South Carolinian by birth, but who had proved himself as patriotic as he was courteous and able, and whose presence and advice had been of the greatest value to me. He, and all of us, felt keenly the wrongfulness of breaking the pledges which we had been authorised to make to these people, and of leaving them to the mercy of the rebels once more. Most of the people themselves took the same view, and eagerly begged to accompany us on our departure. They were allowed to bring their clothing and furniture also, and at once developed that insane mania for aged and valueless trumpery, which always seizes upon the human race, I believe, in moments of danger. With the greatest difficulty, we selected between the essential and the non-essential, and our few transports were at length loaded to the very water's edge on the morning of March 29th, Colonel Montgomery having by this time returned from upriver with sixteen prisoners and the fruits of a foraging in plenty. 
and upon that last morning occurred an act on the part of some of the garrison most deeply to be regretted, and not to be excused by the natural indignation at the recall. An act which, through the unfortunate eloquence of one newspaper correspondent, rang through the nation. The attempt to burn the town. I, fortunately, need not dwell much upon it, as I was not at that time in command of the post. As the white soldiers, frankly, took it upon themselves the whole responsibility, and as all the fires were made in the wooden part of the city, which was occupied by them, while none were made in the brick part where the coloured soldiers were quartered. It was fortunate for our reputation that the newspaper accounts generally agreed in exculpating us from all share in the matter. Footnote. The coloured regiments had nothing at all to do with it. They behaved with propriety throughout. Boston Journal Correspondence. The Negro troops took no part whatever in the perpetration of this vandalism. New York Tribune Correspondence. We know not whether we are most rejoiced or saddened to observe, by the general concurrence of accounts, that the Negro soldiers had nothing to do with the barbarous act. Boston Journal Editorial, April 10th, 1863. End of footnote. And the single exception, which one correspondent asserted, I could never verify, and do not believe to have existed. It was stated by Colonel Rust in his official report that some twenty-five buildings in all were burned, and I doubt if the actual number was greater. But this was probably owing in part to a change of wind, and did not diminish the discredit of the transaction. It made our sorrow at departure no less, though it infinitely enhanced the impressiveness of the scene. The excitement of the departure was intense. The embarkation was so laborious that it seemed as if the flames must be upon us before we could get on board, and it was also generally expected that the rebel skirmishers would be down among the houses wherever practicable to annoy us to the utmost, as had been the case at the previous evacuation. They were indeed there, as we afterwards heard, but did not venture to molest us. The sight and roar of the flames and the rolling clouds of smoke brought home to the impressible minds of the black soldiers all their favourite imagery of the judgment day, and those who were not too much depressed by disappointment were excited by the spectacle, and sang and exhorted without ceasing. With heavy hearts their officers floated down the lovely river, which we had ascended with hope so buoyant, and from that day to this the reasons for our recall have never been made public. It was commonly attributed to pro-slavery advisers acting on the rather impulsive nature of Major General Hunter, with a view to cut short the career of the coloured troops and stop their recruiting. But it may have been simply the scarcity of troops in the department, and the renewed conviction at headquarters that we were too few to hold the post alone. The latter theory was strengthened by the fact that, when General Seymour reoccupied Jacksonville the following year, he took with him 20,000 men instead of 1,000 and the sanguinary battle of Olustee found him with too few. End of chapter 4 Recording by FNH Visit www.bookranger.co.uk Chapter 5 of Army Life in a Black Regiment. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by F. N. H. Army Life in a Black Regiment by Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Chapter 5. Out on Picket. One can hardly imagine a body of men more disconsolate than a regiment suddenly transferred from an adventurous life in the enemy's country to the quiet of a sheltered camp on safe and familiar ground. The men under my command were deeply dejected when on a most appropriate day, the 1st of April, 1863, they found themselves unaccountably recalled from Florida, that region of delights which had seemed theirs by right of conquest. My dusky soldiers, who based their whole walk and conversation strictly on the ancient Israelites, found that the prophecies were all set at naught, and that they were on the wrong side of the Red Sea. Indeed, I fear they regarded even me as a sort of reversed Moses, whose Pisgah fronted in the wrong direction. 
Had they foreseen how the next occupation of the promised land was destined to result, they might have acquiesced with more than their wounded cheerfulness. As it was, we were very glad to receive, after a few days of discontented repose on the very ground where we had once been so happy, an order to go out on picket at Port Royal Ferry, with the understanding that we might remain there for some time. This picket station was regarded as a sort of military picnic by the regiment stationed at Beaufort, South Carolina. It meant blackberries and oysters, wild roses and magnolias, flowery lanes instead of sandy barrens, and a sort of guerrilla existence in place of the camp routine. To the coloured soldiers especially, with their love of the country life, and their extensive personal acquaintance on the plantations, it seemed quite like a Christmas festival. Besides, they would be in sight of the enemy, and who knew but there might, by the blessing of Providence, be a raid or a skirmish. If they could not remain on the St. John's River, it was something to dwell on the Cousaw. In the end, they enjoyed it as much as they expected, and though we went out several times subsequently, until it became an old story, the enjoyment never waned. And as even the march from the camp to the picket lines was something that could not possibly have been the same for any white regiment in the service, it is worth while to begin at the beginning, and to describe it. A regiment ordered on picket was expected to have reveille at daybreak, and to be in line for departure by sunrise. This delighted our men, who always took a childlike pleasure in being out of bed at any unreasonable hour, and by the time I had emerged the tents were nearly all struck, and the great wagons were lumbering into camp to receive them, with whatever else was to be transported. The first rays of the sun must fall upon the line of these wagons, moving away across the wide parade ground, followed by the column of men who would soon outstrip them. But on the occasion which I especially describe, the sun was shrouded, and when once upon the sandy plain, neither camp nor town nor river could be seen in the dimness, and when I rode forward and looked back there was only visible the long moving shadow column, seeming rather awful in its snake-like advance. There was a swaying of flags, and multitudinous weapons that might have been camels' necks for all one could see, and the whole thing might have been a caravan upon the desert. Soon we debouched upon the Shell Road, and the wagon train drew on one side into the fog, and by the time the sun appeared the music ceased, and the men took up the root step, and the fun began. The root step is an abandonment of all military strictness, and nothing is required of the men but to keep four abreast, and not lag behind. They are not required to keep step, though, with the rhythmical ear of our soldiers, they almost always instinctively did so. Talking and singing are allowed, and of this privilege, at least, they eagerly availed themselves. On this day they were at the top of their exhilaration. There was one broad grin from one end of the column to the other. It might have been a caravan of elephants instead of camels, for the ivory and the blackness. The chatter and the laughter almost drowned the tramp of feet and the clatter of equipments. At crossroads and plantation gates, the coloured people thronged to see us pass. Everyone found a friend and a greeting. How do you do, auntie? Huddy, bruddy Benjamin. How do you find yourself this morning, Titiwissa? Such salutations rang out to everybody, known or unknown. In return, venerable, kerchiefed matrons curtsied laboriously to everyone, with an unfailing, breasty lord brother. Grave little boys, blacker than ink, shook hands with our laughing and utterly unimaginable drummers, who greeted them with this sure word of prophecy. Dems de drummers for de next war. Pretty mulatto girls, ogled and coquetted, and made eyes, as Thackeray would say, at half the young fellows in the battalion. Meantime the singing was brisk along the whole column, and when I sometimes reined up to see them pass, the chant of each company entering my ear drove out from the other the ear and strain of the preceding. Such an odd mixture of things, military and missionary, as the successive waves of song drifted by, first John Brown, of course, then what makes old Satan for follow me so, then marching along, then hold your light on Canaan's shore, then when this cruel war is over, a new favourite sung by a few, yielding presently to a grand burst of the favourite marching song among them all, and the one which at every step instinctively quickened so light and jubilant its rhythm. All true children gwine in de wilderness, gwine in de wilderness, gwine in de wilderness, true believers gwine in de wilderness, to take de sins ob de world. Ending in a hoy after each verse, a sort of Irish yell, for all the songs, but especially for their own wild hymns, they constantly improvise simple verses, 
with the same odd mingling, the odd little facts of today's march being interwoven with the depths of theological gloom, and the same jubilant chorus annexed to all thus. We gwin to de ferry, de bell dun ringing, gwine to de landing, de bell dun ringing, trust believer, o oh de bell dun ringing, Satan's behind me, de bell dun ringing, tis a misty morning, de bell dun ringing, on de road am sandy, de bell dun ringing, hell bin open, de bell dun ringing and so on indefinitely. The little drum corps kept in advance, a jolly crew, their drums slung on their backs, and the drumsticks perhaps balanced on their heads. With them went the officers' servant boys, more uproarious still, always ready to lend their shrill treble to any song. At the head of the whole force there walked by some self-imposed preeminence a respectable elderly female, one of the company landresses, whose vigorous stride we never could quite overtake, and who had an enormous bundle balanced on her head, while she waved in her hand like a sword a long-handled tin-dipper. Such a picturesque medley of fun, war, and music, I believe, no white regiment in the service could have shown, and yet there was no straggling, and a single tap of the drum would at any moment bring order out of this seeming chaos. So we marched our seven miles out upon the smooth and shaded road, beneath jasmine clusters, and great pine cones dropping, and great bunches of mistletoe still in bloom among the branches. Arrived at the station, the scene soon became busy and more confused. Wagons were being unloaded, tents pitched, water brought, wood cut, fires made, while the field and staff could take possession of the abandoned quarters of their predecessors, and we could look round in the lovely summer morning to survey our empire and behold our home. The only through fare by land between Beaufort and Charleston is the Shell Road, a beautiful avenue, which, about nine miles from Beaufort, strikes a ferry across the Cousaw River. War abolished the ferry, and made the river the permanent barrier between the opposing picket lines. For ten miles right and left, these lines extended, marked by well-worn footpaths following the endless windings of the stream, and they never varied until nearly the end of the war. Upon their maintenance depended our whole foothold in the Sea Islands, and upon that again finally depended the whole campaign of Sherman. But for the services of the colored troops, which finally formed the main garrison of the Department of the South, the great march would never have been performed. There was thus a region ten or twelve miles square of which I had exclusive military command. It was level, but otherwise broken and bewildering to the last degree. No road traversed it, properly speaking, but the shell road, all the rest was a wild medley of cypress swamp, pine barren, muddy creek, and cultivated plantation, intersected by intermediate lanes and bridle paths, through which we must ride day and night, and which our horses soon knew better than ourselves. The regiment was distributed at different stations, the main force being under my immediate command at a plantation close by the Shell Road, two miles from the ferry and seven miles from Beaufort. Our first picket duty was just at that time of the first attack on Charleston, under Dupont and Hunter, and it was generally supposed that the Confederates would make an effort to recapture the Sea Islands. My orders were to watch the enemy closely, keep informed as to his position and movements, attempt no advance, and, in case they were attempted from the other side, to delay it as long as possible, sending instant notice to headquarters. As to the delay, that could easily be guaranteed. There were causeways on the Shell Road, which a single battery could hold against a large force, and the plantations were everywhere so intersected by hedges and dikes that they seemed expressly planned for defence. Although creeks wound in and out everywhere, yet these were only navigable at high tide, and at all times were impassable marshes. There were but a few posts where the enemy were within rifle range, and their occasional attacks at those points were soon stopped by our enforcement of a pithy order from General Hunter. Give them as good as they send. So that with every opportunity for being kept on the alert, there was small prospect of serious danger, and all promised an easy life, with only enough of care to make it pleasant. The picket station was therefore always a coveted post among the regiments, combining some undeniable importance with a kind of relaxation, and as we were there three months on our first tour of duty, and returned there several times afterwards, we got well acquainted with it. The whole region always reminded me of the descriptions of Levens, and I always expected to meet Henry Laroche Jacqueline riding in the woods. <laughs> 
How can I ever describe the charm and picturesqueness of that summer life? Our house possessed four spacious rooms and a piazza. Around it were grouped sheds and tents. The camp was a little way off on one side, the negro quarters of the plantation on the other, and all was immersed in a dense mass of waving and murmuring locust blossoms. The spring days were always lovely, while the evenings were always conveniently damp, so that we never shut the windows by day, nor emitted our cheerful fire by night. Indoors, the main headquarters seemed like a camp of some party of young engineers in time of peace, only with a little female society added, and a good many martial associations thrown in. A large, low, dilapidated room, with an immense fireplace, and with window panes chiefly broken, so that the sashes were still open even when closed, such was our home. The walls were scratched with capital charcoal sketches by R. of the 4th New Hampshire, and with a good map of the island and its wood paths by C. of the 1st Massachusetts Cavalry. The room had the picturesqueness which comes everywhere from the natural grouping of articles of daily use, swords, belts, pistols, rifles, field glasses, spurs, canteens, gauntlets, while wreaths of grey moss above the windows, and a pelican's wing three feet long over the high mantelpiece, indicated more deliberate decoration. This and the whole atmosphere of the place spoke of the refining presence of agreeable women, and it was pleasant when they held their little court in the evening, and pleasant all day with the different visitors who were always streaming in and out. Officers and soldiers on various business, turbaned women from the plantations, coming with complaints or questionings, fugitives from the mainland to be interrogated, visitors riding up on horseback, their hands full of jasmine and wild roses, and the sweet sunny air all perfumed with magnolias and the southern pine. From the neighbouring camp there was a perpetual low hum. Louder voices and laughter re-echoed amid the sharp sounds of the axe from the pine woods, and sometimes when the relieved pickets were discharging their pieces there came the hollow sound of dropping rifle shots, as in skirmishing, perhaps the most unmistakable and fascinating association that war bequeaths to the memory of the year. Our domestic arrangements were of the oddest description. From the time when we began housekeeping by taking down the front door to complete herewith a little office for the surgeon on the piazza, everything seemed upside down. I slept on a shelf in the corner of the parlour, bequeathed me by Major F., my jovial predecessor, and, if I waked at any time, could put my head through the broken window, arouse my orderly, and ride off to see if I could catch a picket asleep. We used to spell the word P-I-C-Q-U-E-T, because that was understood to be the correct thing, in that department at least, and they used to say at the post headquarters that as soon as the officer in command of the outpost grew negligent, and was guilty of a K, he was ordered in immediately. Then the arrangements for the ablution were peculiar. We fitted up a bathing place in a brook, which somehow got appropriated at once by the company laundresses, but I had my revenge, for I took to bathing in the family wash tub. After all, however, the kitchen department had their advantage, for they used my solitary napkin to wipe the mess table. As for food, we found it impossible to get chickens, save in the immature shape of eggs. Fresh pork was prohibited by the surgeon, and other fresh meat came rarely. We could indeed hunt for wild turkeys, and even deer, but such hunting was found only to increase the appetite without corresponding supply. Still we had our luxuries, large delicious drumfish and alligator steaks, like a more substantial fried halibut, which might have afforded the theme for Charles Lamb's dissertation on roast pig, and by whose aid, for the first time in our lives, we tasted crackling. The post-bakery yielded admirable bread, and for vegetables and fruit we had a very poor sweet potatoes, and in their season an unlimited supply of the largest blackberries. For beverage we had the vapid milk of that region, in which, if you let it stand, the water sinks instead of the cream rising, and the delicious sugar cane syrup, which we had brought from Florida, and which we drank at all hours. Old Floridorians say that no one is justified in drinking whiskey while he can get cane juice. It is sweet and spirited without cloying, foams like ale, and they were little spots on the ceiling of the dining-room where our lively beverage had popped out its cork. We kept it in a whisky bottle, and as whisky itself was absolutely prohibited among us, it was amusing to see the surprise of our military visitors when this innocent substitute was brought in. 
They usually liked it in the end, but like the old Frenchwoman over a glass of water, wished that it were a sin to give it a relish. As the foaming beakers of molasses and water were handed round, the guests would make with them the courteous little gestures of polite imbibing, and would then quaff the beverage, some with gusto, others with the slight afterlook of dismay. But it was a delicious and cooling drink while it lasted, and, at all events, was the best and the worst we had. We used to have reveille at six, and breakfast about seven. Then the mounted couriers began to arrive from a dozen different locations, with written reports of what had happened during the night. A boat seen, a picket fired upon, a battery erecting. These must be consolidated and forwarded to the headquarters, with the daily report of the command. So many sick, so many detached service, and all the rest. This was our morning newspaper, our herald and tribune. I never got tired of it. Then the couriers must be furnished with countersign and instructions, and sent off again. Then we scattered to our various rides, all disguised as duty, one to inspect the pickets, one to visit a sick soldier, one to build a bridge or clear a road, and still another to headquarters for ammunition or commissary stores. Galloping through green lanes, miles of triumphal arches of wild roses, roses pale and large and fragrant, mingled with great boughs of the white cornel, fantastic masses of showy surprises. Such were our rides, ranging from eight to fifteen, and even twenty miles. Back to a late dinner with our various experiences, and perhaps specimens to match. A thunder snake, eight feet long, a live opossum, with a young clinging to it a natural pouch an armful of great white scentless pond lilies after dinner to the tangled garden for the rosebuds or early magnolias whose cloying fragrance will always bring back to me the full zest of those summer days then dress parade and a little drill as the day grew cool in the evening tea and then the piazza or the fireside as the case might be chess cards perhaps a little music by aid of the assistant surgeon's melodeon a few pages of jean paul's titan almost my only book, and carefully husbanded, perhaps a male with its infinite felicities. Such was our day. Night brought its own fascinations, more solitary and profound. The darker they were, the more clearly it was our duty to visit the pickets. The paths that had grown so familiar by day seemed a wholly new labyrinth by night, and every added shade of darkness seemed to shift and complicate them all anew till at last man's skill grew utterly baffled, and the clue must be left to the instinct of the horse. Riding beneath the solemn starlight, or by soft grey mist, or densest blackness, the frogs croaking, the strange chuckwat's widow droning his ominous note above my head, the mockingbird dreaming in music, the great southern fireflies rising to the treetops, or hovering close to the ground like glowworms, till the horse raised his hoofs to avoid them, then pine woods and cypress swamps, or past sullen brooks, or white tents, or the dimly seen huts of sleeping negroes, down to the glimmering shore, where black statues leaned against trees or stood alert in the pathways. Never, in all the days of my life, shall I forget the magic of those haunted nights. We had nocturnal boat service, too, for it was a part of our instructions to obtain all possible information about the enemy's position and we accordingly, as usual in such cases, incurred a great many risks that harmed nobody and picked up much information, which did nobody any good. The centre of these nightly reconnaissances for a long time was the wreck of the George Washington, the story of whose disaster is perhaps worth telling. Till about the time when we went on picket, it had been the occasional habit of the smaller gunboats to make the circuit of Port Royal Island, a practice which seemed very essential to the safety of our position but which the rebels effectively stopped a few days after our arrival by destroying the army gunboat George Washington with a single shot from a light battery. I was roused soon after daybreak by the firing, and a courier soon came dashing in with the particulars. Forwarding these hastily to Beaufort, for we had then no telegraph, I was soon at the scene of action five miles away. Approaching, I met on the picket paths man after man who had escaped from the wreck across half a mile of almost impassable marsh. Never did I see such objects, some stripped to their shirts, some fully clothed, but all having every garment literally pasted to their bodies with mud. Across the river, 
The rebels were retiring, having done their work, but were still shelling from greater and greater distances the wood through which I rode. I arrived at the spot nearest the wreck, a point opposite to what we called the Brickyard Station. I saw the burning vessel aground beyond a long stretch of marsh, out of which the forlorn creatures were still floundering. Here and there in the mud and reeds we could see the labouring heads slowly advancing, and could hear excruciating cries from the wounded men in the more distant depths. It was the strangest mixture of war and Dante and Robinson Crusoe. Our energetic chaplain coming up, I sent him with four men under a flag of truce to the place whence the worst cries proceeded, while I went to another part of the marsh. During that morning we got them all out, our last achievement being the rescue of the pilot, an immense negro with a wooden leg, an article so particularly unavailable for mud travelling that it would have almost seemed better, as one of the men suggested, to cut the traces and leave it behind. A naval gunboat, too, which had originally accompanied this vessel and should never have left it, now came back and took off the survivors, though there had been several deaths from the scalding and shell. It proved that the wreck was not aground after all, but at anchor. Having foolishly lingered till after daybreak, and having thus given time for the enemy to bring down their guns, the first shot had struck the boiler and set the vessel on fire, after which the officer in command had raised the white flag, and then escaped with his men to our shore, and it was for this flight in the wrong direction that they were shelled in the marshes by the rebels. The case furnished in this respect some parallel to that of the Crusiage in Alabama, where it was afterwards cited, I believe, officially or unofficially, to show that the rebels had claimed the right to punish in this case the course of action which they approved in the Semmes. I know that they always asserted thenceforward that the detachment on board the George Washington had become rightful prisoners of war, and were justly fired upon when they tried to escape. This was at the time of the first attack on Charleston, and the noise of this cannonading spread rapidly thither, and brought four regiments to reinforce Beaufort in a hurry, under the impression that the town was already taken, and that they must save what remnants they could. General Saxton, too, had made such capital plans for defending the post, that he could not bear to have it attacked. So, while the rebels brought down a force to keep us from taking the guns off the wreck, I was also supplied with a section or two of regular artillery, and some additional infantry, with which to keep them from it, and we tried to make believe very hard, and rival the Charleston expedition on our own island. Indeed, our affair came to about as much, nearly nothing, and lasted decidedly longer, for both sides nibbled away at the guns by night, for weeks afterwards, though I believe the mud finally got them, at least we did not. We tried in vain to get the use of a steamboat or floating derrick of any kind, for it needed more mechanical ingenuity than we possessed to transfer anything so heavy to our small boats by night, while by day we did not go near the wreck in anything larger than a dugout. One of these nocturnal visits to the wreck I recall with particular gusto, because it brought back that contest with catarrh and coughing among my own warriors, which had so ludicrously beset me in Florida. It was always fascinating to be on those forbidden waters by night, stealing out with muffled oars through the creeks and reeds, our eyes always strained for other voyagers, our ears listening breathlessly to all the marsh sounds, black fish splashing, and little wakened reed birds that fled wailing away over the dim river, equally safe on either side. But it always appeared to the watchful senses that we were making noise enough to be heard at Fort Sumter and somehow the victims of Qatar seemed always the most eager for any enterprise requiring peculiar caution. In this case, I thought I had sifted them beforehand, but as soon as we were afloat, one poor boy near me began to wheeze, and I turned upon him in exasperation. He saw his danger, and meekly said, I won't cough, Gunnel, and he kept his word. For two mortal hours he sat grasping his gun, with never a chirrup, but two unfortunates in the bow of the boat developed symptoms which I could not suppress. So, putting in at a picket station with some risk, I dumped them in mud knee-deep and embarked a substitute, who after the first five minutes absolutely coughed louder than both of the others united. Handkerchiefs, blankets, overcoats, suffocation in its direst forms, we tried in vain, but apparently the rebel picket slept through it all, and we explored the wreck in safety. I think they were asleep, for certainly across the level marshes there came a nasal sound, as of the conthiefery in its slumbers. It may have been a bullfrog, 
but it sounded like a human snore. Picket life was, of course, the place to feel the charm of natural beauty on the sea islands. We had a world of profuse and tangled vegetation around us, such as would have been a dream of delight to me, but for the constant sense of responsibility and care which came between. Amid this preoccupation, nature seemed but a mirage, and not the close and intimate associate I had known before. I pressed no flowers, collected no insects or birds' eggs, made no notes on natural objects, reversing in these respects all previous habits. Yet now, in the retrospect, there seems to have been infused into me through every pore the voluptuous charm of the season and the place, and the slightest corresponding sound or odour now calls back the memory of those delicious days. Before being on picket, at almost every season, I tasted the sensations of all, and though I hardly then thought of such a result, the associations of beauty will remain forever. In February, for instance, though this was during a later period of picket service, the woods were usually draped with that net of shining haze which marks our northern May, and the house was embowered in wild plum blossoms, small, white, profuse, and tenanted by murmuring bees. There were peach blossoms, too, and the yellow jasmine was opening its multitudinous buds, climbing all over the trees and waving from bough to bough. There were fresh young ferns and white bloodroot in the edges of the woods, matched by snowdrops in the garden, beneath budded myrtle and petisporum. In the wilderness the birds were busy, the two main songsters being the mockingbird and the cardinal grosbeak, which monopolized all the parts of our more varied northern orchestra, save the tender and liquid notes, which in South Carolina seemed unattempted except by some stray bluebird. Jays were as loud and busy as at the north in autumn. There were sparrows and wrens, and sometimes I noticed the shy and whimsical chewink. From this early springtime onward, there seemed no great difference in atmospheric sensations, and only a succession of bloom. After two months, one's notions of the season grew bewildered, just as at the very early rising bewilders the day. In the army one is perhaps roused after a bivouac, marches before daybreak, halts, fights, somebody's killed, a long day's life has been lived, and after all it is not seven o'clock, and breakfast is not ready. So when we had lived in summer so long as hardly to remember winter, it suddenly occurred to us that it was not yet June. One escapes at the south, that mixture of hunger and avarice, which is felt in the northern summer, counting each hour's joy with the sad consciousness that an hour is gone. The compensating loss is in missing those soft, sweet, liquid sensations of the northern spring, that burst of life and joy, those days of heaven that even April brings, and this absence of childhood in the year creates a feeling of hardness in the season, like that I have suggested in the melody of the southern birds. It seemed to me also that the woods had not those pure, clean, innocent odours which so abound in the New England forest in early spring. But there was something luscious, voluptuous, almost oppressively fragrant about the magnolias, as if they belonged not to Hebe, but to Magdalen. Such immense and lustrous butterflies I had never seen but in my dreams, and not even dreams had prepared me for the sandflies. Almost too small to be seen, they inflicted a bite which appeared larger than themselves, a positive wound, more torturing than that of a mosquito, and leaving more annoyance behind. These tormentors elevated dress parade into the dignity of a military engagement. I had to stand motionless with my head a mere nebula of winged atoms, while tears rolled profusely down my face from mere muscular irritation. Had I stirred a finger, the whole battalion would have been slapping its cheek. Such enemies were, however, a valuable aid to discipline on the whole, as they abounded in the guardhouse, and made that institution an object of unusual abhorrence among the men. The presence of ladies, and the homelike air of everything, made the picket station a very popular resort while we were there. It was the one agreeable ride from Beaufort, and we often had a dozen people unexpectedly to dinner. On such occasions there was sometimes mounting in hot haste, and in eager search among the outlying plantations for additional chickens and eggs, or through the company kitchens for some of those villainous tin cans which everywhere mark the progress of our army. In those cans, so far as my observation went, all fruit relapsed into a common acidulation, 
and all meats into a similarity of tastelessness, while the condensed milk was best described by the men who often unconsciously stumbled on a better joke than they knew, and always spoke of it as condemned milk. We had our own excursions, too, to the Barnwell plantations, with their beautiful avenues and great live oaks, the perfection of southern beauty, to Hawes Island, debatable ground, close to the enemy's fire, where half-wild cattle were to be shot, under military precautions, like Scottish moss trooping, or to the ferry, where it was fascinating to the female mind to scan the rebel pickets through a field-glass. Our horses liked the byways far better than the level hardness of the shell-road, especially those we had brought from Florida, which enjoyed the wildness as they had belonged to Marion's men. They delighted to feel the long sedge brush their flanks, or to gallop down the narrow wood-paths, leaping the fallen trees, and scaring the bright little lizards which shot across our track like live rays broken from the sunbeams. We had an abundance of horses, mostly captured, and left in our hands by some convenient delay of the post-quartermaster. We had also two side-saddles, which, not being munitions of war, could not properly, as we explained, be transferred like other captured articles to the general stock. Otherwise the PQM, a married man, would have showed no unnecessary delay in their case. For miscellaneous accommodation, there was not an ambulance, that most inestimable of army conveniences, equally ready to carry the merry to a feast, or the wounded from a fray. Ambulance was one of those words rather numerous, which Ethiopian lips were not framed by nature to articulate. Only the highest stages of coloured culture could compass it. On the tongue of many, it was transformed mystically as amulet, or ambitiously as epulet, or in culinary fashion as omelette. But it was our experience that an ambulance under any name jolted equally hard. Besides these diversements, we had more laborious vocations, a good deal of fatigue, and genuine through small alarms. The men went on duty every third day at furthest, and the officers nearly as often, most of the tours of duty lasting twenty-four hours, though the stream was considered to watch itself tolerably well by daylight. This kind of responsibility suited the men, and we had already found, as the whole army afterwards acknowledged, that the constitutional watchfulness and distrustfulness of the coloured race made them admirable sentinels. Soon after we went on picket, the commanding general sent an aide, with a cavalry escort, to visit all the stations, without my knowledge. They spent the whole night, and the officer reported that he could not get within thirty yards of any post without a challenge. This was a pleasant assurance for me since our position seemed so secure, compared with Jacksonville, and that I had feared some relaxation of vigilance, while yet the safety of all depended on our thorough discharge of duty. Jacksonville had also seasoned the men so well that they were no longer nervous, and did not waste much powder on false alarms. The rebels made no formal attacks, and rarely attempted to capture pickets. Sometimes they came stealing through the creeks in dugouts, as we did on their side of the water, and occasionally an officer of ours was fired upon while making his rounds by night. Often some boat or scrow would go adrift, and sometimes a mere dark mass of river-weed would be floated by the tide past the successive stations, eliciting a challenge and perhaps a shot from each. I remember the vivid way in which one of the men stated to his officer the manner in which a faithful picket should do his duty after challenging, in case a boat came in sight. First thing I shoot, and den I shoot, and den I shoot again. Den I creep, creep up near de boat, and see who day him in em. And s'pose anybody pop up de head, den I shoot again. S'pose I fire my forty rounds, I tink he here at de camp, and send more mans. Which seemed a reasonable presumption. The soldier's name was Paul Jones, a daring fellow quite worthy of his namesake. In time, however, they learned quieter methods and would wade out far in the water, there standing motionless at last, hoping to surround and capture these floating boats, though to their great disappointment the prize usually proved empty. On one occasion they tried a still profounder strategy, for an officer visiting the pickets after midnight, and hearing in the stillness a portentous snore from the end of the causeway, our most important station, straight away hurried to the point of danger with wrath in his soul. But the sergeant of the squad came out to meet him, imploring silence, and explaining that they had seen or suspected a boat hovering near, 
and were feigning sleep in order to lure and capture those who would entrap them. The one military performance at the picket station of which my men were utterly intolerant was an occasional flag of truce for which this was appointed locality. These farces, for which it was our duty to furnish the stock actors, always struck them as being utterly despicable and unworthy the serious business of war. They felt, I suppose, what Mr. Pickwick felt when he heard his counsel remark to the counsel for the plaintiff that it was a very fine morning. It goaded their souls to see the young officers from the two opposing armies salute each other courteously and interchange cigars. They despised the object of such negotiations, which was usually to send over to the enemy some family of rebel women, who had made themselves quite intolerable on our side, but were not above collecting a subscription among the Union officers before departure to replenish their wardrobes. The men never showed disrespect to these women, by word or deed, but they hated them from the bottom of their souls. Besides, there was a grievance behind all this. The rebel order remained unrevoked, which consigned the new coloured troops and their officers to a felon's death if captured, and we all felt that we fought with ropes round our necks. "'There's no flags or truce for us,' the men would contemptuously say. "'When de Secesh fight de first South, first South Carolina, he fight in earnest.' Indeed, I myself took it as rather a compliment when the commander on the other side, though an old acquaintance of mine in Massachusetts and then Kansas, at first refused to negotiate through me or my officers, a refusal which was kept up greatly to the enemy's inconvenience, until our men finally captured some of the opposing pickets, and their friends had to waive all scruples in order to send them supplies. After this, there was no trouble and I think that the first rebel officer in South Carolina who officially met any officer of colored troops under a flag of truce was Captain John C. Calhoun. In Florida we had been so recognized, long before, but that was when they wished to frighten us out of Jacksonville. Such was our life on picket at Port Royal, a thing whose memory is now fast melting into such stuff as dreams are made of. We stayed there more than two months at that time, the first attack on Charleston exploded with one puff, and had its end. General Hunter was ordered north, and the busy Gilmore reigned in his stead. And in June, when the blackberries were all eaten, we were summoned, nothing loath to other scenes and encampments new. End of chapter 5 Recording by FNH Visit www.bookranger.co.uk